Wassalatu wassalam ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Brothers, sisters, dear believers, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Respected guests, good evening and greetings to you. On behalf of the Islamic Information and Da'wah Center, I welcome all of you. Thank you for visiting and teaming up with us on this topic tonight. Very interesting topic. Did Jesus die for the sins of the world? From Vancouver, we were supposed to have CJ Forward to enlighten us with this topic. Unfortunately, uncontrollable delay at the airport. So tomorrow or later on today, he will be speaking. Meanwhile, we will have the Amir of the Islamic Information and Da'wah Center, Brother Shabir Ali, putting lights on this intellectual evening. And tonight, please allow me to remind you of two rules. One, there is no need for a trampoline. There is no need for an emotional trampoline. It is a civil intellectual evening. It's supposed to be a dialogue. We'll see what time uh, Mr. Forward will come. Secondly, there is no need for some of us to hang up their brain outside by the door, bring it in, plug it in, and examine some of the facts with the freedom to believe it or to leave it. Believe it or to leave it. There will be some question and answer period. And please write your questions clear and brief in order to accommodate all of you. Once again, most welcome and have a good evening. We will start with Brother Shabir Ali. Praising Allah, the Lord of the worlds. And I ask him to send peace and blessings upon the last of all of his prophets, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, ladies, gentlemen, men and women of understanding, did Jesus die for the sins of the world? I'd like to examine this question from a few different perspectives. First, the Quranic perspective, and second, the Christian perspective. First, from the Quranic perspective, did Jesus die for the sins of the world? From the Quranic perspective, the answer has to be no. First, according to the Quran, Jesus did not die, but God raised him alive into heaven, from which place he will come again before the end of the world. So Jesus did not die, and by implication, did not die for the sins of the world. Second, from the Quranic perspective, no one dies for someone else's sins. It is quite clear in the Quran that every human being will be held responsible for his or her own actions. We are going to ju be judged according to what we do, not according to what someone else has done against us or for us. In fact, to say that someone else has died for my sins would make that someone else uh, suffer in my place. From the chronic perspective, this would be unjust. This would be a matter of penalizing an innocent person in order that a guilty person should go free. So from the perspective of the Quran in brief, we can say the answer is no. Jesus did not die for the sins of the world. But then, how do we deal with what is commonly called by our Christian friends, the sin problem? Our Christian friends see that there's a problem with sin and they wonder, uh, how do Muslims get forgiveness for sins? How is it understood in Islam that people can just simply walk away scot-free after having committed sins? Or is it that just for the purpose of saving the human beings, God would just simply ignore sins? Can God really ignore sins? Our Christian friends say no. They say God is holy and so he cannot ignore sins. Our answer is that according to the Quranic perspective, God does forgive sins. It doesn't hurt God in any way if you or I sin. It does not take anything away from his greatness. It does not reduce his power in any way if we sin. When we sin, we hurt ourselves. And this is why we are taught to pray, Our Lord, we have wronged our souls. And if you do not forgive us and have mercy on us, then surely we are the losers. You notice in the prayer we say that we have wronged our souls. 
Not that we have wronged God in any way, because we cannot reduce the status of God. We cannot take away anything from His glory by our sinning. Our sinning hurts us. And so we ask God to forgive us for our sins. Can God forgive? Yes. In fact, God created human beings knowing that we are going to sin. From the glorious Quran, we know that when God created Adam and Eve, he created them deliberately knowing that they are going to sin. In Surah 2, Surah Baqarah in the Quran, we learn that when God declared that he is going to create Adam, the angels asked, are you going to create a being who is going to spread corruption and do wrong, whereas we, the angels, are always worshipping you and you alone? Uh, God replied, I know what you do not know. And as it follows, we see that the angels declare that they know nothing except what God has already taught them. Now putting two and two together, it is quite clear that God had already made the angels know from the inception that human beings will be sinners, that human beings will commit sins. It shows that God then deliberately created human beings knowing that they are going to commit sins. For what purpose? The Prophet Muhammad and whom BP said that if human beings did not commit sins, God would wipe them out and bring in their stead another being who would commit sins and who would ask God for forgiveness and God would forgive them. It seems clear then that God's purpose in creating us, or one of his purposes, is that he would exercise his ability to forgive sins. He created us knowing that we will sin, but also willing to forgive that sin whenever we turn back to him. The Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said, every child of Adam is a sinner, but the best of sinners are those who repent after having committed sins. We see then that God, according to the Muslim view, does not require from us 100% accuracy in everything that we do. God expects us to be failures at some point in some ways. And God is willing to overlook those shortcomings and he's willing to set our matters right for us so long as we turn back to him and we ask him to repair our circumstances and mend our deeds. So God then created us knowing that we're going to sin and he's willing to forgive those sins. We can relate to this concept because many of us have been in school at some point and we have submitted tests. What would you think of a professor or a teacher who demands from you that unless you get 100% in every test, you cannot even pass? You're going to think that this professor doesn't seem to understand human nature. It is within human nature to, to sin. That is part of being human, we err. We make mistakes. And so God who made human beings, already made us knowing the mistakes that we're capable of, and if he's not willing to forgive, we might have the same opinion of him that we might have of the college professor who demands 100% in every test. We know that it is very unusual for anyone to score that kind of perfect mark every time. It, it is indeed rather unusual to have even a straight A student. But straight A student doesn't mean 100% in everything. It means getting a very high degree of accuracy in everything. And so what God requires from us is that we should try our best. We should always return to God. But as much as we return to him and we seek his forgiveness, he is willing to forgive us. This is the Quranic perspective. There is, however, according to the glorious Quran, one sin which God is not going to forgive unless a person absolutely turns back and changes his or her ways. And that is the sin of associating partners with God, taking someone else to be worshipped along with God, or saying some things about God which implies that he has partners or associates, saying that God has a wife or a son or, or certain associates or mediators between human beings and God, mediators who can dictate for God who to forgive and who not to forgive. God retains, according to the glorious Quran, his absolute power in every way. And nobody can 
limit that power in any way. There's no way for anyone to have a claim on God to make sure that he acts according to their behest, according to their will, according to their instructions and direction. So to say any such thing, to limit the power of God and make him equal with someone else or make someone else equal with him is the unforgivable sin in Islam. In order to be forgiven for that sin, one has to turn away completely. Ask God to forgive that person. And there's one simple way of doing that, by embracing the religion of Islam. The Prophet Muhammad and whom BP said that when a person embraces Islam, all of his or her previous sins are forgiven that very moment. And so then to put it in a nutshell, the answer from Islam is no. Jesus did not die for the sins of the world. He did not even die yet. Now let's uh, turn for a moment to the uh, biblical perspective and see what we can find there. Did Jesus die for the sins of the world? Here we have two answers and I'd like to give you both answers one after another. The first answer is no. Jesus did not die for the sins of the world. And that answer comes from the Bible. The second answer is that yes, he did die for the sins of the world and that answer comes also from the Bible. It just so happens that the Bible was written by many persons over the centuries and uh, some of these persons had uh, different understandings of what God teaches. Uh, one such person in particular is a man by the name of Saint Paul who said that he was a disciple of Jesus. He said that Jesus appeared to him as a bright light and gave him a message to preach to the people. The answer in his writings is that yes, Jesus did die for the sins of the world. But I'd like to give you the other answer for the moment and then we'll come back to Paul's answer. The answer from the majority of the texts in the Bible is that Jesus did not die for the sins of the world. First, it is quite clear from the Bible that human beings are going to be judged according to their own actions. It is said, for example, in the Gospel according to Matthew, that when the angels come towards the last day to take the people, the angels will separate them based on what they have done. Those who have done good will go into everlasting pleasures and those who have done evil will go into everlasting suffering and damnation. So it is quite clear then that the deeds of the individuals will be the criterion by which the individuals are going to be judged. We find furthermore in the Gospels themselves that Jesus on whom be peace taught people that they must do right. And this implies that the deeds are going to be the things that will judge them. According to Matthew chapter 5, for example, Jesus directed his followers that they should not take the wide open way, but they should follow the narrow way. Because he said the narrow way is the one that leads to paradise, but the wide open way is the way that leads to destruction. In other words, he's teaching his followers to take that path which usually looks restrictive. Usually you have a number of restrictions, things you cannot do, for example. And that may make life appear narrow for some people. They say we cannot have enough flexibility to move. We'd like much more freedom. But Jesus and whom be peace, according to Matthew's gospel, taught his followers, do not follow the path of freedom, but follow the narrow path. So much so that according to that gospel, he told his followers that uh, they should live by every one of the commandments, big or small. He said that whoever will practice any one of these commandments and teach others to do so, he will be called greatest in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever will teach people to break these commandments, he will be called least or smallest in the kingdom of heaven. And so we see that the deeds are emphasized also by Jesus. Jesus on whom be peace according to the Gospels uh, taught his followers that they should still maintain circumcision for example. That they should still keep the Sabbath although not to the extent that the Jews were keeping the Sabbath with all of their elaborate laws and regulations concerning the Sabbath. He told them that the Sabbath is made for man not man for the Sabbath. In other words the Sabbath is made to keep human beings in good check but not to stifle human beings. And people were practicing the Sabbath regulations in such a way that it really stifled them. And so he came to relax some of that law which the people were practicing. He still told them that they should practice the same things, 
but not to the extent that they were practicing them. So he still gave them laws, he still gave them regulations. He told them, for example, that they must act like their forefather Abraham did. He said that if you want to really be children of Abraham, then you must do the things which Abraham uh, did. And so he emphasized action, he emphasized right conduct, he emphasized the things, the very things which Muslims also emphasize. And in fact, if you say that somebody died for your sins, then that runs contrary to the idea of performing right action. Because the idea of performing right actions means that it uh, is done with an expectation that you're going to be judged according to these actions. And furthermore, and I should say now thirdly, the third point is this, that the, the entire Bible, apart from the writings of Saint Paul, and, and prior to the writings of St. Paul, we should say, it makes it quite clear that human beings do not need someone to die in their stead. You see, in the Old Testament, which is basically the Bible of the Jews, it is stated many times that if you commit certain sins, what you do is you sacrifice an animal, and that will be the thing based on which God will forgive your sin. So in other words, you commit a wrong, you sacrifice the animal. God says in the Old Testament many, many times, at least 14 as I've been able to count, your sins will be forgiven. It says so many, many times. You do this and the sins will be forgiven. In fact, according to Leviticus, the book of Leviticus in the Old Testament, which is part of what the Jews would call the Torah, there are some instructions that are given on how to celebrate what is called the Day of Atonement or Yom Kippur as the Jews still celebrate today. On that day, according to that instruction, the high priest, which uh, used to be Aaron at one time, the first high priest, the brother of Moses, that uh, he's to take two goats. One of them, uh, he will uh, sacrifice. And so he will let the blood spill and he will sprinkle the blood on the altar in a particular way. But the other one, the other goat, uh, it says that Aaron is to place his hands on the he goat's head. And by placing his hands on this goat's head, he is to put the sins of all the entire community upon the head of the goat. And then he should send that goat out into the wilderness. What will happen then? The goat will therefore take away the sins of the people. That was the understanding. So in other words, according to those instructions which are still in the Bible today, there is a way to get rid of your sins without having anyone dying for you. All you need is this goat. And that incidentally is where the term scapegoat comes from. You know when you want to put your blame on someone else, you say let's find a scapegoat. And uh, it so happens that this is where the term came from. You get a goat that takes the blame of all of the people and goes away with it so the people are now free. So did these people need someone to take away their own sins? No, they already had the goat which took away the sins and there was no reason then to have a human being die in their place. If now you have a human being comes and dies in the place of those people, it would mean that their sins are taken away twice. First by the goat and then secondly by the human being. So we should stick with the one. It is quite clear that according to the Bible, human beings would have their sins taken away in that particular manner and they do not need someone else to come and die in their stead. A fourth point we can mention is that, in fact, the Bible itself shows that nobody else can die for the sin of the guilty person. On one occasion it is quite clear that God was angry with the people of Israel because they continuously disobeyed God. And Moses stood up to plead for them and he said, God, let these people go, just forgive them. Otherwise if you won't forgive them then blot me out of the book of life. You know, erase my name from the book of life. But God's reply to Moses according to the Bible itself is that God will not penalize the innocent person in order to let the guilty go free. So Moses does not have to be blotted out from the book of life. And God is willing to forgive people even without having somebody else blotted out from the book of life. So according to the Bible's answer, it is no. So the, maj the majority of the Bible gives us the impression that there is no one to die for your sins. 
you bear your own sins. To illustrate this point furthermore, we have a book uh, known as Ezekiel in the Bible. According to this book in chapter 18, the soul that sins is the very one which is going to die. Not that somebody else will die for you. In fact, it quite clearly specifies that if there is somebody who has sinned, that sin does not get blamed on his children. His children, for example, are not going to be penalized because the father was unrighteous. So long as the child himself is righteous, the child will not be penalized for the sins of the father. The father alone will die for his own sins. And likewise, the chapter goes on to explicate that the ch sin of the child will not be transferred to the father. So the sin of the child is the child's own sin. So long as the father himself is righteous, he will not bear the sin of the child. So the sin does not get transferred from one generation to the other. The child is not to be penalized for the sin of the father, nor is the father to be penalized for the sins of the child. It says in the Bible, in that chapter of Ezekiel, chapter 18, the soul that sins is the one that will die. So the one that sins, that's the one that's going to die, not someone else, not someone else in place of that one person. Now when we look at the teachings of Jesus a little bit more clearly, we see that much of what he taught indicated that he didn't come to die for the sins of the world. For example, in Luke's Gospel, Jesus declared quite publicly, he said, I must go and preach to the poor people, for this is why I have come. In other words, that's why he was sent, that he should go and preach the message, not that he should die for the sins of humankind. In John chapter 17, we read that Jesus and whom BP said that he has now completed the work which God gave him to do. But he was still alive. He had not been arrested yet to be crucified. And he can already say he has completed the work which God gave him to do. Which is that work? He had preached to the people. That's why he had come, according to his own sayings. Now I want to examine then the writings of St. Paul in the Bible and to see why the Bible also gives a different answer. We've seen so far that according to the Quran, Jesus did not die for the sins of the world. We've seen also according to the majority of the Bible, Jesus did not die for the sins of the world. There is no reason for Jesus to die for the sins of the world. There is no one to die for another person's sins. Each person is to be penalized for his or her own crimes. So how is it then that in the Bible we also have the opposite answer? We also have the answer that yes, Jesus did die for the sins of the world. Where does that answer come from? I've already indicated that this answer comes from the writings of a man by the name of St. Paul. He became a very influential teacher in Christianity and uh, this indeed is what he taught. Now the New Testament is that portion of the Bible which uh, makes the Bible distinctively Christian. I've already told you that the Bible includes the Old Testament which is basically the Bible of the Jews. In addition to the Old Testament, you have the New Testament, which is the thing that makes the Bible distinctively Christian. In other words, that's where you find specifically Christian documents. The New Testament is made up of 27 individual writings. You might say 27 books, to keep it simple. Out of the 27 books, 14 of them are said to be writings of Paul, or writings of Paul and his disciples, or people closely associated with the teachings of Paul. At one time it used to be said that all 14 of these writings were written by Paul. Nowadays many of the scholars dispute that. They say that one such writing, the letter to the Hebrews, is an anonymous writing. We cannot know who the author is, but some of his ideas are definitely close to what uh, St. Paul himself had written. We see also that some of the letters, at least six of them, perhaps seven, are said by scholars to be written not by Paul himself, but by some of his disciples after him. But nevertheless, they all belong to what you might call the Pauline school, a particular way of thinking about the life and significance of Jesus. According to these writings, which you can see now is a dominant writing in the New Testament because it is 14 out of 27, Jesus did die for the sins of the world. It is explained in these writings that the first human being committed a sin, that is Adam, he and his wife. They ate the forbidden fruit. And because of that sin, all human beings became separated from God. And to repair that 
wrong then, somebody else has to die in the place of the first Adam. The first Adam sinned and brought death into the world. It is said by St. Paul in his letter to the Romans that the wages of sin is death. And the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. According to these writings then, because of the first human being Adam, death entered the world. If he had not sinned, people would not die. And according to that explanation then, because of the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, because Jesus died for the sins of humankind, now human beings can get eternal life as a gift from God. The first man brought death, the second man, that is Jesus, now brings life. How does he do that? According to Paul's writings, it was essential that Jesus should have died and be raised back up to life. According to him, Jesus has to act as the high priest to go and approach God and get him to forgive our sins. Because the high priest in the Old Testament used to go into the sacred region of the temple and present the offerings of the people to God. Now according to Paul, this new high priest now, he goes up to God taking himself as the offering to God. Now because Paul had been very influential, we see that the church that emerged after Jesus on whom be peace split into two major portions apart from some other splinter groups. One portion had in it the disciples and close followers of Jesus and whom be peace, men like Peter, James, and John. On the other hand, you had Paul and his followers following an entirely different stream. The stream that became dominant is the stream that followed Paul. And this is the same stream, the same school, that eventually selected the books which were to be included in the New Testament. So when you read the Bible today and you read the New Testament, you're getting a view of Jesus closely corresponding to that of Paul himself and his own students. You're getting then not the original teachings of Jesus, but you're getting the teachings of Jesus filtered through this one particular stream, this one particular school. And so all of the four Gospels now that you have in the Bible, out of the 27 books you have the 14 letters of Paul, you also have four Gospels. All of the four Gospels which deem to describe the life and teachings of Jesus and whom be peace, actually were written from the perspective that Jesus died. And died also for the sins of the world. Some of them make that statement very explicitly, some of them make it indirectly, but all of them were written from that same perspective, as though it is taken for granted that this is what Jesus came to do. All of them were written to just simply show that Jesus died on the cross. So much so that it can be said about some of these documents that they are merely narratives about the crucifixion plus a long introduction. Everything that comes before the crucifixion is just simply there to lead up to the crucifixion. That has become the main point in Christianity. Where does that point come from? It has come from the writings of Paul. Paul said if Jesus was not crucified and if he was not raised from the dead, then your preaching is vain and your faith is vain. So much so that Paul himself could write in one of his letters that Jesus died according to my gospel. So that was the gospel that Paul was preaching. He had his own understanding of what the gospel is so that he can call it my gospel. And according to him, that was the main point of the gospel, that Jesus died for the sins of human beings. Now the gospels which were written were all written after Paul. This is the ones that we have in the New Testament today. You have four gospels written by, uh, for convenience, we say Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, because we don't know who these people are exactly, and we call them by the traditional names that they have been called, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. All of these four writings came after Paul, and so they're imbued with the ideas which are there from Paul. And all of them tried to explain in some way or another why Jesus had to die for the sins of the world. Now this becomes a very difficult problem, and so they go on with a variety of explanations. According to three of these Gospels, Jesus was not willing to die on the cross. According to Matthew, according to Mark, according to Luke, he was begging God up until the very last moment to save him from the cross. It is said that the night before he was arrested to be put on the cross, Jesus was praying. He was praying and he was asking God, God, if it be possible, 
Let this cup pass away from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. In other words, according to this, Jesus didn't want to go ahead with this. He can see that death awaits him. He knows that they will come at any moment and try to arrest him and crucify him. And he doesn't want this to happen. He's asking God to come up with something else. Let there be some other way of dealing with this. But let Jesus not have to go through with this. According to one of these Gospels, the Gospel according to Luke, an angel came down from heaven. Actually two angels to strengthen him. Perhaps to give him more resolve. But even after that it says in the Gospel of Luke that his sweat were like great drops of blood. So much he was in agony over what awaited. He didn't want to go through with it according to Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So much so that according to Matthew and Mark, two of these Gospels, even after Jesus was put on the cross, when he was about to die, he finally said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And it shows that right up to the very end, he didn't want to go through with it. He was not a willing participant in this scheme. So this presents a problem. If God is determining to let the innocent people go free, and he's crucifying Jesus instead, it would have helped matters if Jesus was willing. The fact that Jesus is not willing makes it look very bad on God. How? Because you have to imagine the scenario. It is as though God has before him a bunch of criminals. God is like a judge having the criminals and the judge says to the criminals, criminals, I love you. Go free. But he says, somebody has to die because that's the law. For the criminals to go free, somebody has to pay the price. So who's going to pay the price? Guards, bring my son. And then the guards come in bringing the son and the son comes down on his knees and he says, Father, please, is there no other way? Please, Father, think of something fast. Let it not happen like this. I'll go along with what you say, Father, but please, isn't there some other way? The father says, no, son, sorry, you got to die. That's the law. Criminals, I love you. Go free. You see, it doesn't look very good on God if Jesus is not a willing participant in this scheme by which God wants to forgive the people. And so the fourth gospel, the one which was last to be written, sends this problem and tried to deal with this particular problem. You must realize that the gospels initially when they were written were written as separate individual documents. And they were circulated in different lands. Eventually, people thought it uh, better to compile all of these gospels into one single book and so they compiled them they collected them from various regions compiled them into one single book but prior to that they were circulated individually so those who read mark's gospel did not know what was in matthew's gospel and those who read luke did not know what is going to be in john so finally when john is writing his gospel this is about now 70 years after jesus had already been taken up into heaven john wants to make sure that he gets over this problem it should not appear in John's Gospel as though Jesus is not willing to go ahead with this because this makes him look very much like a human being and it makes it look very bad on God that God has this unwilling participant in this whole scheme. So according to John's Gospel then, Jesus was quite willing. That from the very start, Jesus already knew he was the Lamb of God who came to die for the sins of the world. From the very start, it is said in John's Gospel that uh, Yahya or John the Baptist already declared that this is the Lamb of God who came to die for the sins of the world. So Jesus must have known it and everybody must have known it right from the very start. According to this gospel then Jesus declares that he is willing to go ahead and die for the sins of the world. He said for example in this gospel that I am the shepherd who dies for his sheep. He says nobody can take my life away from me. Because I've been given authority to lay down my life and I've been given authority to take it back up again. In this last gospel, Jesus appears much more powerful than he used to appear. He's no longer the weak human being that was praying to God, asking God to take this cup away from me. Now he's a powerful individual. He's almost like a divine being walking the surface of the earth or perhaps even floating above the surface of the earth. 
And so he does not pray here to be saved from the cross. But rather he makes it quite clear that he's going willingly. And he says, nobody can take my life away from me. I've been given authority to lay down my life. And I've been given authority to take it back up again. As if he's going to be resurrected by his own might, by his own power eventually. Eventually when he's to be arrested, according to this gospel, he comes out and powerfully gives himself up to be arrested. So that when he finally is put on the cross, and he's about to die. Now you remember what he said according to some other gospels. He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But in this gospel he doesn't say any such thing because that would make him appear weak, would make him appear unwilling. And it would make him appear as though he was forsaken. That he was hoping for something else than what eventually happened. So according to this gospel he doesn't say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Instead, he says, it is finished. And then he finally dies. As though you have here a picture of a man who was trying to accomplish something. And then finally when it is accomplished, he says it is finished. And then he lets his soul go out. As though he actually came into the world specifically for this. To die for the sins of the world. Now today when many Christians read the Bible, they remember Jesus as the willing participant, as the one who deliberately came into the world to die for the sins of the world. They do not remember that he was an unwilling participant according to the other three Gospels. You see the story has been reworked in order to make Jesus appear a little differently than he appeared in the other three Gospels. So now he appears willing and he goes through with this whole scheme. If he appears willing, well then this makes it look a little bit better on God. See, that's how the story has been revised. Now, if Jesus appears willing, then we can have a different scenario. We no longer have the scenario of the judge who wants to let the criminals go free, and he says, bring my son, and the son comes in weeping, crying, and praying. Now you have a situation where the judge is willing to let the criminals die. And he says, criminals, you've got to die. That's the rule. But the son comes in and says, Father, I have pity on these people. Let them go and I will die in their stead. And this is the image that many of the preachers and evangelists really love. They love this image because it makes better for an image of God and of Jesus. So now, God all only has to say, okay, criminals, you go free because somebody else has offered to die in your place. And God then perhaps is not so happy crucifying his son, but because the son has offered, God goes ahead and lets it happen that way. Now this makes it look better for God according to this revised story. However, this does not free the story of all of its problems. Because once you say that Jesus died for the sins of the world, even if you said it this way, you still have a major difficulty. And the difficulty has been this. If Jesus and whom be peace can come in, and have compassion for the people. And he can say, Father, let them go, because I feel sorry for them. If Jesus can have that much compassion, why couldn't the Father himself have that much compassion, even more? Why couldn't he have said to the people, people, you can go free. Because if you sin, that doesn't hurt me. And I don't want to hurt you, I'll let you go free. Now it appears that Jesus has more compassion than what the Father had. The father appears like a very stern judge. He's willing to demand blood. But Jesus comes in as a loving, caring individual, willing to shed his own blood in order that the father should be happy and the people should go free. Now as a result of this imagery, it is quite true, if everyone would search their hearts, that Christians love Jesus more than they love the Father. And why should that be so? In fact, the Bible throughout, from beginning to end, calls on people to love God. And the Quran calls on believers to love God more than anything else. The Quran says, وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَشَدُّ حُبَّ لِلَّهِ Those who believe love God more than anything else. Or they are more severe in their love for God. 
So why should it be that people love Jesus more than they love the Father? But it is a reality. This is what has happened. And I'm not the first one to make this point. A Christian writer by the name of William Ellery Channing in the 19th century has already made this point in one of his writings, saying that indeed Christians love Jesus more than the Father. So that that love which they should have had for the Father has been displaced and redirected towards Jesus. Yes, indeed, the idea that Jesus died for the sins of the world is riddled with problems. First of all, we've seen that this runs contrary to the majority teaching of the Bible. The Bible from beginning to end, before the writings of St. Paul, has been telling people that you don't need someone to die for your sins. That nobody dies for your sins. Jesus, in whom be peace himself, came and taught people a number of things which all add up to the same simple fact. That nobody dies for your sins. In order for you to be forgiven, you turn back to God and you ask him for forgiveness and he shall forgive you. But if you say that Jesus died for your sins, then you run to a number of problems. Once St. Paul had already taught that, these are the problems that he had to deal with. People trying to explain this point, to express it in different ways, have come up with a number of different things that they have said to explain it. And all of these have problems of their own. Now how does the death of Jesus actually take away the sins of the people? According to Mark's Gospel, Jesus was a ransom for many. It says in Mark's Gospel that Jesus told the people that the Son of Man came to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's according to Mark chapter 10 verse 45. But think of this word ransom. What does it mean to you? Ransom means that somebody is kidnapped, held hostage. You pay a ransom and then the hostage goes free. Isn't that what ransom means? But now, the Christian scholars throughout the generations have struggled to try and explain this. How is Jesus a ransom? William Barclay in his daily Bible commentary on the Gospel according to Mark uh, lists a number of propositions that have been given by Christian scholars throughout history to this question. How is Jesus a ransom? Because think about this. When you pay a ransom, it is paid to someone. And usually it is the person who has held the captives hostage. Now if Jesus is paid as a ransom, who is he being paid to? Is he being paid to the devil? Some of the Christian scholars actually said that initially. They said the devil had held the people captive. God wanted to free the people. And so in order to free the people, God had to pay his son to the devil. So that the devil, the shaitan, could let the people go. But some later scholars said, no, that doesn't look very good. Because that would seem to indicate that the devil has equal bargaining power with God. I mean, who is he to demand God's son before he lets the people go? And so they've come up with different reasons. Some, some of them said, well, what God did was God used his son as a trap. So that when he was on the cross and the devil tried to catch the son... The devil got himself hooked on the cross. And so all the people went free. Well, this kind of explanation might be convincing to some, but I bet for most of you this is not a convincing explanation. And after going through all of the various things that the Christian scholars have said over the ages, William Barclay, a man who is a scholar himself, finally concludes in his daily Bible commentary that it is better not to think of this word ransom. Just think that it is an act of love. But then, if you don't want to think about it as a ransom, then you acknowledge that the way it is stated in the Bible is not a proper way of thinking about it. And that shows a major problem. Once you start to say that Jesus died for the sins of the world, you run into major problems. Because it is something which does not tie in with the rest of the scripture. And in fact, it is not reasonable at all. Other writers of the Bible have found other ways to try to explain this. For example, we've already seen that according to the Gospel of John, it was said that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But then look, you still run into a problem. If he's the Lamb of God, then you must imagine a lamb is being slaughtered and that one takes away the sin of the world. But then, which really is the Lamb of God that does that? Muslims offer a sacrifice. Is that to take away the sins of the world or to take away anybody's sins? 
Um, Christians understand from the Old Testament that the Jews used to offer sacrifices every year. They used to sacrifice a lamb. We've already mentioned about the scapegoat. Remember there were two goats. One was killed and his blood was sprinkled on the altar. The other one had all the sins of the people put on the head of that goat and it was taken, it was let to go out into the wilderness, taking away the sins of the people. Was that one killed? No. This one that took away the sins of the people wasn't slaughtered then if you say that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, then he shouldn't be killed. Because the goat which took away the sins wasn't killed. It was just simply let loose, alive, into the wilderness. So if you try to say that he's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, that does not solve the problem either. So there are a number of difficulties that we find with this whole concept that Jesus died for the sins of the world. One, we see that it is unjust because you're penalizing an innocent person in order to let the guilty go free. Two, it doesn't look good for God because it makes God appear very cruel. Sure, the son appears very loving. He loves the people. He wants to die for them if you say that he is willing. But if he's willing, if he loves the people and he wants to die for them, what about God himself? Instead of being loving, is he cruel? So that's how it makes it look for God. That's the second problem. A third problem is that it makes it look as though God is powerless. He has to give his son over to the devil. He has to give up his son in order to get something. But we know that God is powerful according to the Bible, according to the glorious Quran. So this is not a very favorable way of looking at God. It's not a favorable way of uh, understanding this question. A fourth problem is that if you say that Jesus died for the sins of the world, well, that would mean that God should have no longer any claim on human beings. God can no longer penalize you or I for the sins that we commit because our sins are already paid for. Remember, if our sins are already paid for, that means we can go ahead and sin and God could no longer penalize us. In fact, some of the people who had read some of the writings of Paul eventually took this view and they went ahead committing sins drunkenness, adultery, and so on. And then Paul had to write back to them and tell them, no, you can't really do it that way. Just because God has been graceful to you, he has given you some of his bounties, he has forgiven you, doesn't mean that you should take advantage of that. You should be good. But that, of course, misses the main point. If you think that God is going to question you for your sins, then you make absolutely sure that you don't commit too many. When you go to the store, for example, you look at your change, you see you've got a penny extra. What do you do with that penny? If you think that God is going to ask me about this penny, well then you make sure you hand the penny right back. You say, look, sorry, you give me one penny too many. But what has happened, as we have noticed, and we read on the news again and again, is that some of these people who go about preaching, oh, Jesus died for your sins, uh, and so on, the very same people we read about that they commit one mistake after another. They become publicly exposed. Perhaps the thing that makes a person refrain from sin is the idea that God is going to question me about these crimes. And the thing that perhaps makes a person more free to commit wrong is the idea that somebody's already died for my sins. So if somebody's died for my sins, logically, it is implied that God can no longer penalize us for the same sins. So see the number of problems that are associated with just saying that Jesus died for your sins. Now one way of explaining this has been to say that because the first man committed a sin, the effect of that was on all of the people. And now to cancel that effect, Jesus came and died. But let's see if this has actually materialized. First, what was the effect of the first sin? We've already hinted that according to Paul's writings, that because of the first sin, death entered the world. If Adam didn't sin, Paul says, we wouldn't have been dying. Now that Jesus came and died, he has paid the penalty. He has reversed things. So that would mean that we should no longer die. But that has not happened because people still keep dying for the last 2,000 years after Jesus 
People still keep dying as before. Another consequence was mentioned is that as a result of the sin of Adam, Adam will have to keep struggling for his living. It is said in the book of Genesis that Adam will have to eat bread by the sweat of his brow and he will have to gather his food from among thorns and thistles. In other words, life will be tough. Now if I ask you, you will say life is tough even here in Canada. We are still sweating for our living, isn't that right? So the death of Jesus has not reversed the circumstances. Thirdly, it was said in the book of Genesis that as a result of the sin of Adam and Eve, Eve will have to forever bear children or continue bearing children in pain. Well, that has not really changed, has it? Women are still bearing children in pain. So the death of Jesus has not reversed this whole scenario. A very important point is this, that as a result of the sin of Adam and Eve, they were driven out of the Garden of Eden. Now, if Jesus died for the sins, then the people should be returned to the Garden of Eden because they were driven out as a consequence of the sin. Now that the price is paid for, they should be put back in. Think of it this way. Suppose we have the hostage and we pay the price, then the hostage should be released. The hostage was in freedom, held in captivity, we paid the price, should be taken out of captivity and given freedom again. So now if Adam and Eve were in freedom of Garden of Eden, they can roam wherever they want, they can eat whatever they want, then because of their sin they are now in captivity in the sinful imperfect world. Now that the price is paid, they should be removed back, put, placed in the Garden of Eden, the place of freedom. You see, they were deprived of a certain thing because of what they did. Once the sin is paid for, they should be put back in. Suppose somebody is banished from Canada, he is deported because of a certain crime, and now his crime is paid for, then he should be allowed to come back in. Otherwise, there's no reason to pay the, crime, the price. And if I'm deported for a certain crime, I'm going to say, well, if I can't come back in, I won't pay the price. Why pay the price? If Jesus and whom be peace died for that sin, to pay the price, well then, the reverse should occur. People should go back in to the Garden of Eden, into the paradise. And that has not happened. So all of these points make it quite clear that Jesus and whom be peace, according to the Bible, did not die for the sins of the world. According to Paul, he did die for the sins of the world, but we see that this very concept is riddled with a number of problems. Now the understanding among many Christians is this, that because of the first sin, men became separate from God. There became a separation and there was somebody needed to bridge the gap between man and God. And that person was Jesus. In order to bridge that gap, he had to come and suffer on the cross as he did. But that too has not really changed, has it? In fact, when we go to the teachings of Jesus and whom be peace in the Bible itself, we can see that his teachings on the main run contrary to Paul's teachings. Although it is true that the Gospels which now record the teachings of Jesus were all written from the perspective of Paul, or at least are close to his perspective, still we see that some of the teachings of Jesus, even appearing there now, still go to show that people are not penalized for their sins in the way that Paul understood. And that no one is to be penalized for the sins of the innocent. According to the Bible in Matthew chapter 6, for example, Jesus in whom be peace taught a certain prayer to his disciples. He taught them that you pray to God saying these words. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thine kingdom come, thine will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Now think about this for a moment. How do we forgive those who sin against us? Do we say, I really want to forgive you, but I can't until you pay the price? Because if you pay the price, there's no forgiveness. This prayer, according to the Bible, is recorded in two different versions. One in the Gospel of Matthew, another one in the Gospel of Luke. According to one version, the words are, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. According to another version it is, forgive us our debts as we forgive those who are indebted to us. But let's think about the debt wording for a moment, because that will make the matter a little bit clearer, easier to understand. Suppose one of you owes me five dollars, and you come back and say, Brother Shabir, I know I owe you the five dollars, but I've lost my job, 
and I really want to pay you back. Can you give me some more time? And I say, well, sure, you know, five bucks. In any way, just cancel that. Never mind the five bucks. What's five dollars between two friends? So that means I've forgiven the debt. That's how we forgive each other. But I cannot say, oh, I, I really would like to forgive you. But the only way I can forgive you is if your brother pays it for you. You see, if somebody pays it, that means I have not forgiven. I've claimed my five dollars, I get my full price, and I haven't exercised any forgiveness. Then if you really want to thank somebody, you shouldn't thank me, you should thank your brother because he paid it for you. And remember what we said, people love Jesus more than they love the Father because they think that Jesus paid the price for them. So in any case, the way that Jesus taught people to pray indicates that they're asking God to forgive us as we forgive each other. And when we forgive each other, we do not claim the price from anyone in order to forgive. Furthermore, according to the Gospel of Luke, in chapter 15 in particular, Jesus told many stories, to many parables, you might say, to indicate how God forgives sins. According to Luke chapter 15, there is what we call the story of the prodigal son. Jesus told that, uh, consider this, that a man has two sons. One day, the younger of the two sons says, Father, give me my share of the inheritance so that I can go my own way. And the father gave him his share and he went away and he spent it all. Eventually he was broke, he took up a job minding pigs. Which for a person, uh, you have to imagine a Jewish upbringing, for a person like that to mind pigs, that's the filthiest job you can have. But he thought to himself one day, he said, you know what, my father has servants who are in a better position than I am. So why don't I go back to my father and ask him to take me back? So he went back. And when his father saw him coming in the horizon, his father was overjoyed. His father said, come, quick, slaughter the fatted calf so that we can throw a banquet. He said, bring a new ring, put it on my son's finger. Bring a new robe and put it on his shoulders. The father was happy. And the son who was there all the time at the father said, Father, you know, I've been with you all this time serving you. You never threw a banquet for me. But now this good for nothing is coming back. And you're throwing a banquet for him? The father said, son, you don't understand. He said, this son, this son of mine who was lost today is found. And that explains the joy of the father. Jesus told this story to illustrate that when a person comes back repentant to God, God is willing to forgive that person and to welcome that person just as much, even more so, than that father was willing to forgive the son who came back after spending all his money. So you see, according to the teachings of Jesus that are still lay within the Gospels itself, indicate that nobody dies for your sins. Now think about this father. Did he say, son, yes, I want to forgive you, but I can't forgive you until somebody pays the price? No. So we see then that the sins can be forgiven and should be forgiven even without requiring the price. So where have we come so far? We've answered the question from three different perspectives. The first perspective was from the Quran. We've said according to the Quran, Jesus did not die and therefore he did not die for the sins of human beings. According to the Quran, everyone will be responsible for his or her own crimes. God can forgive us. And God forgives us especially when we repent. When we ask God to forgive us, He forgives us again and again. There is one thing that God will not forgive us unless we ask His forgiveness and we turn and seek His forgiveness. That is the sin of associating partners with God. If we worship someone other than God, if we say that God has a son or a daughter or a wife, any kind of consort or mediator, anyone to make him change his mind, taking away from the absolute power of God, that is the sin known as shirk of associating partners with God. That God will not forgive according to the glorious Quran unless we change our ways. And to do that, one has to embrace the religion of Islam. But the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said that when one does that, all of his previous sins, all of her previous sins are forgiven. We've answered the question also from the perspective of the Bible. And we've seen that the Bible gives us two perspectives on this question. One perspective is that no, Jesus did not die for the sins of the world. The majority of the Bible, everything prior to what St. Paul has written, have made it quite clear 
that everyone dies for his own sins. The son does not die for the sins of the father, nor the father for the sins of the son. We've seen according to the Bible that there were ways in which animals can be sacrificed for sin. But no way was it possible that a human being is penalized for the sins of the others. Moses offered, but his offer was rejected. We see then that according to the majority teaching of the Bible, Jesus did not die for the sins of the world. We see according to Jesus' own teachings in the Bible, it is quite clear that there's no way that Jesus could have died for the sins of human beings. We've seen also that uh, the Bible also answers yes, in particular in the writings of St. Paul, that uh, according to him, Jesus did die for the sins of the world. In fact, he's the man who, to whom the credit for this idea can be given. Uh, St. Paul taught quite clearly that the wages of sin is death and the gift of God is eternal life through the sacrifice that Jesus made. All of the writings on, of, in the New Testament were written after St. Paul and the writings which were collected to be made part of the New Testament were collected because they were closest, e more easily harmonized with the teachings of St. Paul himself. And so we see that if we were to read St. Paul's writings in particular, we would see that Although he taught this doctrine, and although the other writings tried to coincide somehow with this doctrine, this doctrine is riddled with its own problems. There are a number of problems. It makes God appear unjust. It makes God appear cruel. It makes God appear powerless, that he cannot do anything but give his son over to the devil. We've seen that a number of problems associated with this. It makes God unable to to penalize anyone for crimes because somebody has already paid for the crimes. So the solution for somebody who wants to really follow the Bible today is to first realize that the Bible has two answers. One that's reasonable and one that is not so reasonable. So stick with the reasonable position which is already there in the Bible. And if one comes to that position one will find him or herself closer to what the Quran already teaches because you will find there that according to what the majority of the Bible teaches there's no way that Jesus could have died for the sins of the world how then does one get forgiveness for sins one gets forgiveness by following the message which God has revealed in the Bible and the message which God has revealed finally in the last of all of his books the glorious Quran men women I'd like to invite all of you to follow that message which God has finally revealed. Now the Bible itself teaches people that they should follow a message which will come from God. According to the book of Moses in Deuteronomy, in chapter 18, verse 18, we have there a description of a prophet who's going to come later on. And we can see that the prophet Muhammad, on whom be peace, is that prophet. We see that according to the Gospels, and in particular the Gospel of John, chapters 14 to 16, there is mention of one who is going to come after Jesus. Jesus said it is imperative that I go, because if I do not go, he cannot come. Who was that? We believe that man to be the prophet Muhammad on whom be peace. One of the Bible translations, the Bible in living English, says that Jesus told the people that after I go, God will send another spokesman. Many people had thought that this was the Holy Spirit who was to come after Jesus. But, as we can see from the Bible itself, the Holy Spirit was already there even while Jesus was here. Although he said, it is imperative that I go because if I do not go, he cannot come. So Jesus is speaking not about the Holy Spirit that was already there, but another one to come after him. And one of the Bible translations seemed to have hit it right when it rendered it saying that Jesus said that God will send another spokesman. Prophets are spokesmen from God. According to the meaning of the word prophet, it indicates one who is called to speak on behalf of God. He's God's spokesman. We believe that this final spokesman from God did come. He is the Prophet Muhammad on whom be peace. And I call upon all of you to welcome, to receive, to believe in this spokesman from God. And by believing in him, you will be saved. When Jesus was asked, what should I do in order to be saved? According to the Gospel of Mark, Jesus said that in order to be saved, you must keep the commandments. And part of God's commandments is that you must listen to his prophet. According to Deuteronomy chapter 18 verse 19, God said that when he sends that prophet, whoever does not believe in this prophet, I will require it from that person. So in other words, God says, I will bring you to judgment. I'm going to ask you about that. Why did you not listen to my prophet? So men and women, that prophet has come. To be saved today, we have to believe 
in all of God's prophets. We have to believe in Abraham. We have to believe in Moses. We have to believe in Jesus. And last of all, we have to believe in Muhammad, on whom be peace and the blessings. The sisters, uh, for the respected guest who just arrived, was supposed to be with the priest C.J. Forward from Vancouver. He was delayed at the airport. Brother Shabir himself was delayed three hours at the airport, right from the airport to the microphone here. Jazallah khair. Uh, right now we will exhibit some of the questions and uh, just a little bit of reminder, brothers and sisters. Most of the people here I'm looking at, um, they are Muslim. So for kind of uh, this kind of gathering and evening dialogues, it is good to invite non-Muslims, to invite your colleagues, to invite your neighbors, your friends, to, make, to get the benefit of this kind of dialogues. Question number one, Brother Shabir, you did say that Jesus did not die. He was taken by the angels. Could you tell us where is he now? Will he come back again? When? <laughs> yes. Now, we believe that Jesus, on whom be peace, was taken up into heaven. I don't know if I said that the angels took him into heaven. Perhaps you heard me say that according to one of the Gospels, uh, two angels came down to strengthen him. But I didn't say that they took him up into heaven. Uh, God tells us in the Quran, رَفَعَهُ اللَّهُ إِلَيْهِ God raised him to himself. Now, usually we speak of Jesus as being in, in Jannah. And the, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said that when he went into the paradise during the night of the ascension and uh, night, the night journey and ascension, he saw Jesus السلام, also in paradise. Uh, so we believe that Jesus السلام, is in heaven and that from heaven he will come again before the last day. The religion that he will follow when he comes back. According to the authentic narratives from the Prophet Muhammad on whom be peace, Jesus uh, on whom be peace will follow the Sharia, the law as given to the Prophet Muhammad wasallam. So he himself will be uh, acting like the Muslims act. And this is not uh, unusual to expect because you can see that in many things Muslims are already acting like the way Jesus acted. In other words, if you uh, look at what Jesus spoke, when he spoke about God, did Jesus ever say God is three in one? No. You can never find this anywhere in the Bible that Jesus said God is one in three. But you will find that Jesus said that God is one. Now today, Muslims also say that God is one. So when Jesus comes back, and you find that one group of people are saying God is one in three, and another pe group of people are saying God is one, which group do you think Jesus will identify with? Jesus will say, these are my people, because they're saying the very things which I used to say, God is one. Now if you look at any old uh, paintings of Jesus, you will see that uh, according to the artist's conception, which is a true conception in this case, Jesus, on whom be peace, used to wear a beard. Now when Jesus looks at the men who are like him, following his example and the examples of all of the prophets, guess which group he's going to pick? The group who are actually following the same practice. It just so happens that it was a Roman custom to shave the beards. And eventually some artists started to depict Jesus as though he is the sun god, S-U-N. The sun god Apollo with a shaven face. And the Romans continued that practice. We know that the Roman Catholic Church was the dominant church at one time. Then the Eastern Orthodox Church split from that. Then the Roman Catholic, the, the Reformation period, all of the Protestant churches split away from the Roman Catholic Church, but they all came following the same old Roman influence. Due to Roman influence, uh, most of the people who claim to follow Jesus today shaved their beards. But the Muslims who are following Jesus on whom be peace and all of the prophets, including last of all the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, do actually grow their beards. Now if you look at the way that Jesus prayed according to the Gospels, in particular in, God, in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 26 in verse 39, it says that Jesus fell on his face and prayed. So how did Jesus worship his God? He fell on his face and prayed. Now if you look around today, who are the people who actually fall on their faces and pray? So if Jesus comes in and he looks to see who are the people who he should pray with, He's going to fall on his face with the rest of the people who are falling on their faces. 
And so we find in a hadith of the Prophet, he's saying from the Prophet Muhammad on whom be peace, that when Jesus comes back, it'll be at the time of the morning prayer for the Muslims, and Jesus will actually come and pray with the Muslims. Now we look at a thing like circumcision. In Canada now, there is a debate over circumcision because now Ohib doesn't cover circumcision because the Muslims have been too quiet about that. Muslims are a powerful voice, but you haven't spoken. Now, circumcision was practiced by Jesus. According to the Gospel of Luke, in chapter 2, Jesus himself was circumcised when he was eight days old. And according to the Gospel of John, Jesus said that circumcision has to be kept, otherwise the scripture would be broken. In other words, if you did not circumcise you, your children, you would be breaking the scriptures. So who are the people who practice the circumcision today? The Muslims. So if Jesus wants to identify with his people when he comes back, he will identify with the Muslims. Now, Jesus and whom be peace taught people to follow all of the old rules, except ones which he specifically abrogated. And he told the people, you must follow every one of these commandments, even up to the smaller ones. Now, some of these commandments included things that can be eaten and things that cannot be eaten. According to the Bible itself, pork cannot be eaten. You cannot eat the, the meat of swine, the flesh of swine. Jesus maintained the same commandment, so did his early disciples after him. But later on, we know that people started eating the flesh of swine. But Muslims maintain the original teachings. So when Jesus comes back and he wants to share a table meal, He's going to make sure that the meal that he sits down to doesn't have any flesh of swine. If he comes to the Muslim meal, he's going to be very comfortable there. Because Muslims do not eat the same thing which Jesus himself would not eat. We see that uh, in Jesus' lifetime, there was no cross ever involved in his worship. If he went into the synagogues where Jesus preached, according to the Gospels, he went into the synagogues many times to worship and to preach to the people. Were there any crosses in the synagogues? No. So the, people, the places where Jesus is accustomed to going and praying has no cross. When you come into the Muslim place of worship, there is no cross. So Jesus is going to be, feel very comfortable. When he bowed down to his God, there was no image to which he bowed down. And Jesus in whom be peace will find it very comfortable to come and worship also with the Muslims. So we see that in a number of different points. When we examine him carefully, we see that the people who are really following Jesus and who really deserve his company are the people today we know as Muslims. And so I invite, I don't say this as a way of uh, you know, belittling any other person or belittling their faith or making it uncomfortable for them. I recognize that in this gathering there may be a few people who are following a different faith. There might be in particular some of you who are Christians. So I say these things out of compassion and love for all human beings to invite you to be with that group whom Jesus will be with when he comes back. This is your choice ladies and gentlemen and I invite you to exercise that choice today to do the right thing as the evidence is presented before you. If you didn't know you might say you had an excuse but after listening to this lecture and hearing all of the reasonable arguments, hearing the scripture quotations and you can see that what I'm telling you is true. Now it is imperative upon you that before you even leave this hall tonight you should mention to one of your Muslim friends that it is time for you to also join the ranks. Here he is interested to answer one of these questions and may open another kind of uh, interesting points. Please uh, come here, Paul. I was walking by visiting a friend uh, two weeks ago and I saw the announcement for a debate and I thought this looks very interesting and I come with pleasure and I appreciated the breadth of your scholarship and understanding and the, the fairness with which you present things. Um, a couple of things, I, I am a Christian and I have a very close friend who is Muslim and we have debates, we are musicians together and so we have interesting discussions. Um, some of the problems you presented with the idea of Jesus dying on the cross, I thought that I might present um, maybe a more accurate Christian perspective or at least my Christian perspective because we all know that there are uh, there are Muslims and there are Muslims, there are Christians and there are Christians, there are Jews and there are Jews. Uh, uh, some people who truly believe, many people in this Christian country who really do not believe in Christ but they would call themselves Christians. So there are different perspectives. I think the first problem you mentioned with the idea of Jesus dying 
for our sins was that that makes God unjust, that it means that criminals go free. Thank you. That it means that criminals go free. And I think the Bible says that all of us are sinful. It says there is no one righteous, not even one. And even the best we can do are but filthy rags compared to the goodness of God and the holiness of God. And so, in that sense, we are all criminals. But we rely on God for forgiveness. So whether God forgives through Christ or whether God forgives just because He is the all-loving, all-powerful, forgiving God, we're still criminals. We're still the same people who need forgiveness because we have sinned. And He is faithful and just if we repent of our sins to forgive. So I think that in both Islam and Christianity, people need forgiveness. And it is God who forgives. But in Christianity, we believe that God forgives in the Old Testament through the sacrifices of animals. And that in the New Testament, Jesus is the final sacrifice. So that we no longer need to sacrifice animals. The second point you made, or the, the problem with Jesus dying for our sins, is that God is cruel, but Jesus is loving. That people look at God as the, the mean, stern, angry God in the sky, but Jesus was so loving that he came to bear our sins. The Bible says that God sent Jesus, that God so loved the world that he gave his son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. That it is in fact because of God's love for us that he became flesh in the form of Jesus. And that it is not God being cruel and Jesus being nice, but it's actually God whose love for us made him want to atone for our sins once and for all. The third point you made is that God is powerless and it was only, it, the problem with Jesus dying for our sins is that it makes God look powerless and only Jesus could forgive. But again, it's the same thing that it is God who through his mystery and through his own wisdom decided that enough is enough. Sin must be forgiven and is to be forgiven through Jesus. It is God who made that happen. It is God who made Jesus be born by the Virgin Mary. It is God who did all these things. So God is not in fact powerless but powerful to make all this happen because again of his love for us. The fourth point, and you explained this very well, that uh, if Jesus died once and, all for, once and for all for our sins, does that mean then that we're all forgiven and we're free to sin as much as we want because the sin is forgiven? Well, no, of course not. And as you said, the Apostle Paul, he had to correct people because they said, hey, if my sins are forgiven, I can go have a wild time. I can live a loose life now and go free because God, God's almost dumb. He paid for my sins and now I can go free. But the Apostle Paul says, no, 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 that's not it at all. That we are not free to continue to sin. In fact, we've been saved from a life of sin. How can we go back to that life again? It would be crazy. It would be like we've been saved from a drowning ship and we get pulled onto the good ship and then we think we can jump back onto that dr drowning ship and not die. No, we will die. And I guess the, the fifth point that you made was that if Jesus, oh, I guess the fourth point, the sins are paid for. Jesus died for our sins, but we must all personally accept Jesus' sacrifice in the same way that you just presented. We must all individually believe in Muhammad and, and uh, put faith in him that that is how we are saved. In the same way, if people do not put faith in Muhammad, you believe they will not be saved. We Christians also believe if people do not put faith in Jesus, they will not be saved. They're not saved just because he did that act 2,000 years ago. People are saved when they put faith in God and thank God for what Jesus did for them. 
And the final point you made was that if Jesus did die for our sins and set everything right, shouldn't we all be back in Eden? I think there are some things that make that impossible. There's just too many people. How could we all fit back in Eden? And Eden was then, and Eden has changed. Again, when Jesus died for our sins, he didn't set the whole world right. He made it possible for us to approach God because the sacrificial lamb had paid for our sins. So those are just some of the things um, that I understood. And maybe if there's a, a question, I don't know. Thank you very much. And uh, you scared me for a while. I thought you were going to talk about the goats. I mean the goat, yeah, the scapegoat. Because I really can't handle much of talking about the goats. Because simply I was born in a desert and uh, my only pets is a goat, you know, when I was little. So here we have uh, CJ forward. And thank you very much, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We need more questions. Uh, CJ forward from Vancouver. He already arrived from the airport. So please, uh, let's shower with the questions here. At the same time, um, speaking uh, with, uh, with Paul, regards to his point when he said that believing in uh, uh, Jesus, peace be upon him. See, if there is, if there is a Christian here, and there is a Jews here, a Jews, he would say, I am saved, I go to heaven because I believe in Moses. And then a, and a Christian will say, I am saved, I will go to heaven because I believe in Jesus. Muslim will say, we believe in Jesus, peace be upon him, and we believe in Moses, peace be upon him. For in all ways we are saved. We welcome here uh, CJ Forward from Vancouver, who is uh, well equipped about this subject, and we thank him very much for making the effort for coming tonight. Sorry for the delay, the airplane, and uh, please welcome him with me. Thank you very much. I'm, I, um, I really count it a great privilege to be here, and I'm very sorry that I, my plane was late. This is one of the uh, great trials of modern travel. I still think it's better traveling. It's better to travel by plane than by horse or camel or something. But, but uh, I, uh, I, I, I was um, very distressed, actually, to find that the, the plane was something like uh, almost four hours late. So I'm, I'm very sorry that uh, this didn't work out as we had planned. But anyway, uh, if anybody has any questions. I've already spoken. Are you up to speaking? Yes, indeed. Would yes. Would you like to give us your presentation? Surely, you yes. Yes, all right. Um, in that case, uh, what I will do, if I, if I may, um, I how he will be identified, he, and uh, will he still be the Messiah? Okay. Now, uh, second, uh, que the second question first. Uh, Jesus on whom be peace is the Messiah. This is not something that he was temporarily, but that is something that he is. Messiah means a person who is selected by God for a particular task. In the Old uh, Testament, we see that the kings who were uh, appointed for their kingship were anointed with oil. That is a way of marking them off as somebody who has so specifically been designated. Now, the, king, uh, the Old Testament shows that there's going to come in the future someone who is going to be specially designated by God himself. And that was who Christians eventually understood as Jesus uh, by this term Messiah, the one who is anointed. Now the same term is used in the Quran in Arabic, Al-Masih, which means the anointed one. It is a designation that he has. It will not be taken away from him. Uh, just like saying, you know, somebody is a teacher. We, we might keep calling that person teacher uh, forever, even if they stop teaching. So when Jesus comes back, he still has that designation. That's a designation that's given to him in the glorious Quran. He's called Al-Masih, the Messiah, uh, Jesus, son of Mary. Now, how will he be recognized? The Prophet uh, Muhammad, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, gave some descriptions of Jesus. He said, I saw him, uh, a man of fair complexion. His hair looks like it is still wet, that when he comes back also, his hair will be dripping with water or appear to be dripping with water or perhaps glistening. 
Uh, I don't know if you'll be using any of the modern gels that uh, we've seen, but in any cases, here will be uh, glistening. There are a few other descriptions which uh, I'm not too clear on right now. But uh, an important thing is that the spectacular manner in which he will come back will be plain to all. That he will come back on the wings of two angels. He will arrive on a mosque in Damascus when the Muslims are getting ready for the morning prayer. He will arrive even according to one hadith, he says, on the east minaret of that mosque. And then he will come down and he will pray with the Muslims. Then he will go out and he will slay the Antichrist. So when he does that, there should be no dispute about who exactly he is because he will be the one to slay the Antichrist and nobody else will be able to do that but he. Thank you. Of the question of did Jesus die for the sins of the world, it's a very interesting one indeed. And it's one that I would say not only I presume that, that this is, would be denied by most, if not all, Muslims. And there are many Christians who do not accept that Jesus died for the sins of the world uh, or do not understand why Jesus had to die. Uh, the great problem which we have, great mystery, is why there is death at all, why anybody has to die. You know, I'm, there's um, a... <clears throat> There's a wonderful poem which was originally written in Arabian, in, in Arabic, which I don't read, unfortunately, but translated into English. It goes like this. O sons of men, you add the future to the future, but your sum is spoiled by the gray cipher of death. There is a master who breathes upon armies, building a narrow and dark house for kings. These wake above their dust in a black commonwealth. O oh, sons of men, you see a stranger upon the road. You call to him, and he does not stop. He is your life, walking towards time, hurrying to meet the kings of India and China, hurrying to greet the sultans of Sina and Nubia, who were blown over the mountain crest by a certain breath, even as he. And this, I think, expresses very well the great tragedy of death. And so the question is, why did death enter into the world? What is it that, uh, that causes death, and why is it in the world at all? Why did God not create us to live forever? Uh, <coughs> there's another poem, this time by an Englishman. It says, now do I see this world for what it's worth? Is the sun but one more festering star spewing venom on the abscess of the earth? And is this planet something like a scar? pitted on the smooth features of the void, a passing blemish on which we are marooned, which must be brought to nothingness, destroyed, or healed over like a superficial wound? And is our life a gleam, a flash of light, glimpsed through the half-closed eyelids of the night? See, that's, again, the problem. It, death would seem to make everything futile, of no value at all. This is the problem the atheist and the agnostic has, because Really, if this is all there is to life, it's just a glimpse. It's glimpse, as the poet says, to the half-closed eyelids of the night. We really don't perceive what there is to perceive. The, the very important question of why death entered the world is dealt with by the Apostle Paul. And I want to point out there's a great harmony between what is called the Gospels or the Angel and the Apostle Paul. Nowhere does the Apostle Paul contradict what is already written in the Torah, the Law, and the Gospels. He elucidates a lot of what is there, but I've never seen in all my years of study of the Scriptures any point where he contradicts what is there. But we may discuss that later. But, but the, the point that he makes the explanation of why death entered into the world is given in the fifth chapter of his letter to the Romans. And he says, he says, for if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And then he goes on, he says, he says, for if by the, uh, sorry, he says, uh, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, 
even though those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam, who is a type of him who is to come. But the free gift is not like the transgression, for if by the trans transgression of the one, thank you, if, if by the, the transgression of the one the many died, much more did the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to the many. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For on the one hand, the judgment arose from one transgression resulting in condemnation. But on the other hand, the free gift arose from many transgressions resulting in justification. Now the question is, he, he clearly shows here that what we call death arose as a result of sin, and the sin actually of one man, which was then passed on, transmitted, you might say genetically, to the whole human race. And since it arose by one man, the problem of the solution to sin can also be resolved by one man, the equivalent. And that one man is called the second Adam. We know him also by many names. We know him as Jesus, the Messiah, uh, we refer to him also as the Lamb of God. He has many, many titles, but basically that one man is the solution, the antidote, you might say, to the problem. Why does he have to have somebody come down and die? And I've, I've had sometimes Muslims tell me that the idea of the, what we call the vicarious atonement is ridiculous. It's rather like saying, well, I'm sick and you take the medicine for me. What good does that do? And of course, it would do no good at all, but the analogy is false. The analogy should be not on the question of medicine, it should be on the question of health, of, of law. And I want to give you an illustration, which I think will, will perhaps help us to see very clearly First of all, the problem that arose with sin and God's law and his solution for that. <clears throat> I want you to imagine that I'm a very kind and a very rich person. Now, I'm not particularly either. I'm certainly not rich. And I'm, I'm not particularly kind, but I hope to be. I mean, I'd like to be kind. But let's imagine, uh, use your imagination for a moment, and imagine that I'm exceedingly rich, a multi-multi-billionaire, and I'm also very generous. And I come to a place, I, I live in a country where the laws are very harsh, and I see a lot of homeless children running around, and they're breaking the law. And sometimes they're breaking the law by doing very serious things, like running drugs, stealing, even murdering. And sometimes they're just breaking the law by crossing on a red light when they shouldn't, walking into the road, what we call jaywalking. But the penalties are enormous. The penalties for any one of breaking any of these laws are to be fined thousands and thousands of dollars. Every time they accumulate a further fine. And the only way they can survive is to stay out of the way of the police, hide from them. Because if they're ever caught, they're taken to jail, and they stay there until they can pay the fine, which they can never pay, by the way, because they only earn a few dollars a day, like many homeless children in the world today. So I see these homeless children around, and I think, I want to take them into my house. I have a large house. I can feed and clothe them. I can look after them. And I wouldn't ask anything of them. And I invite any one of these children to come into my house. And uh, of course, some of them don't believe me. Some of them think that I have ulterior motives. But I'm inviting them into my house because I really want to do something good for them. But I make no preconditions. This is important. I don't care if they be murderers, or drug pushers, or rapists, or pickpockets, or if they've simply walked on the grass that says, stay off the grass. It doesn't matter to me. I'm going to invite all of them. Now, once they're in my house, I'm going to insist that they do live by certain rules. They can't stay in my house and continue to be rapists and drug, and drug addicts and drug pushers. No, no. But I am going to not consider what they did in the past. But there's a problem here. Because, you see, they are lawbreakers. The fines are hanging over them. What do I, what do, I do about that? 
Well, I could take them into my house and hide them, but then I would become a lawbreaker myself. So what I do, since I'm very friendly with the judge, I go to the judge and I say to him, look, I've got a whole lot of children in my house and they are trying to lead a clean life and not get into more trouble. And I'm educating them and I'm, I've washed them up and I've given them clean clothes and you'll recognize them by their clothes. But I want you to drop all the charges that are against them. Now, the judge is a personal friend of mine, and I have great confidence he will do this for me. But then the judge says to me, well, he says, this is a problem, because if I do that, if I simply drop the charges, what happens to the law? It becomes very arbitrary. I drop it for you, but what about for somebody else? I mean, the law becomes a laughing stock. I can't do this. So I say, well, what's the solution? What is the solution? Then I think, well, just a moment, I'm a multi-billionaire. How much do these children owe? Oh, they owe thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars in fines. I say, never mind, I'll pay the fine. Would that satisfy the law? And he says, yes, I suppose, yes, the fine's paid, but I can't just let them off without the fine being paid, because that makes us a mockery of the law. But if you want to pay these fines, sure, I'll, I'll wipe everything off the slate. So I say, okay, how much is it? And I write him a check, and he knows it's good. And then I say, but you know, some of these children, they are, some I know they're gonna be very bad, and they may even go back into the street. And if they do, I'm not looking after them, so you can arrest them if you want to. But whilst they remain in my house, I, I won't throw them out of the house if they're, because, you know, a lot of things they do, not because they're bad, but because they're absent-minded. They may walk across a red light just not thinking about it. And I know the fine's very, very severe for doing this in this particular country. But what I'll do, I'll leave you a blank check. And any time any of these children actually break the law unintentionally, without thinking about it, in some minor infraction, I don't mean if they're going out to murder somebody, but in some minor infraction, Look, this check will take care of it. Just write in whatever you want. Now, what I've done here, I've illustrated in this illustration the whole picture which the Bible gives of the reason for God's law to be honored. And I'll, I'll read a scripture on that which, which, which emphasizes that. And I've also shown that when one becomes a Christian, is it accepted into the household of God, it is unconditional. There are no preconditions attached. Now many people misunderstand that and think that there are no conditions whatsoever from then on. That is not true. The Bible is very plain. We are saved by faith and not by the works of the law or anything we did in past life. But once we accept this, that faith must be a living faith and not a dead one. And the Bible defines a dead faith as one without works. In other words, if there are no works attached to the faith, it's a dead faith, and we are not saved by dead faith. We are saved by living faith. So there are conditions. Coming into God's household, there are conditions imposed, as there are for all religions. But the preconditions are none. The only precondition is just to accept the free gift that God has given. Now, what I find fascinating, and I'm speaking as a former agnostic who did not believe the Bible, did not believe that it was even possible to know God, what I found absolutely fascinating when I studied the Bible was that here was a picture which was given, a picture which was harmonious, although the different parts of the picture were scattered all the way through the Bible. You have to remember, the Bible was written over a period of 1,600 years. Unlike the Quran, which was written in a period of 23 years, the Bible was written over a period of 1,600 years. You would expect to find many contradictions. You'd expect to find terms and expressions in the Bible which would be similar to that of the nations surrounding the nation of Israel. That is not so. There are many terms and expressions Theologies, uh, uh, theological concepts which were existing in all the nations around about the nation of Israel that are not found in the Bible. Absolutely amazing. 
that they're not there. But even more amazing is that it's like seeing the pieces, the different pieces of a jigsaw puzzle scattered around. And when you gather all those pieces together, they make a harmonious and clear, distinct picture. Now, that can't happen by chance. If I were to distribute um, 40 pieces of paper to 40 different people here, and I said, I'd say, draw me a part of a picture of a horse, say. There's no way I could collect up those 40 pieces and I could put them together and have a picture of a horse. Or if I asked 40 different people to write some theme for me, I couldn't pick up those 40 different themes afterwards and make some coherent whole. But in the case of the Bible, we do have that. It's estimated that there are at least 40 people who were involved in the actual writing down of the Bible. But the theme is harmonious. That's why we, th we believe, I as a former agnostic, believe it really did come from God because it had to be somehow inspired and directed for, by him to remove, to keep out what was, should not be there and to put in what should be there. Now on the matter of uh, the, 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 the question of what we call the atonement, the ransom of Jesus, this is clearly stated by Jesus himself in three of the Gospels. Now, the law of Moses stated that a thing had to be established by two or three witnesses. And we have three witnesses, three, what we call the three synoptic Gospels, clearly have Jesus himself saying he came to give his life as a ransom, or he came to give his blood for the benefit of mankind. It's not the Apostle Paul who said this, it's Jesus himself. And if you have a Bible where, where the, the sayings of Jesus are written in red, you'll see that if you look for the red parts of the Bible, you'll see that those, that's not a quotation of Matthew or Mark, it's a quotation of Jesus himself. So the, the question is, how can God be righteous? And this is a question which is, by the way, which is scarcely asked, let alone answered, in any other religion. But the question is, how can God be righteous when declaring the sinner righteous? That's the problem. How can he be righteous when declaring the sinner righteous? See, Paul expresses this, this, uh, this problem, as I call it. He says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his, in his blood, through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. For the, for the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time, that he might be declared righteous when declaring righteous the one who has faith in Jesus. So there are two persons have to be declared righteous here. And it would seem to be an impossible situation for God to declare righteous the one who, who is in fact not righteous. And I want to explain the difference between being declared righteous and being righteous. Being declared righteous is a legal term. See, nobody is righteous. That's the problem. There is no righteous person on the face of the earth. There are only those who have been declared in a legal sense to be righteous. What the Apostle Paul says there, he says that he's fought the good fight, and then henceforth, he said, is reserve me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me in that day, not to me only, but to all those who've loved his manifestation. Now, when he says there's reserve him the crown of righteousness, he doesn't mean a crown for righteousness. The crown is righteousness itself, and that will come not in this life, but in the life to come. It's, it's the reward God, God gives. It's the most marvelous reward. See, sometimes we think of reward as being living in paradise, having a wonderful time, drinking wine that would never make us sick, all these things. But no, the greatest, greatest reward that God can give us is to actually to remove sin from our nature so we become truly righteous, and not only have a legal standing of righteousness, and that's what Paul is looking forward to. The word he uses there when he says the word crown is Stephanos. 
And Stephanos has nothing to do with a crown that's given to a king to rule. Uh, Stephanos was given to a victor in a game when he completed in the games. He received a wreath which was called a Stephanos, a crown. And that's what Paul's looking forward to. That crown, that, that, that um, uh, righteousness itself to be up, up, upon him. It's what I look forward to because I know that I sin like everybody else. I don't sin deliberately, and that's why I believe I can remain in God's household, because I don't sin, but I sin by nature. I sin without thinking, as everybody else does. And I, I continue to see myself in God's household until he throws me out for whatever, for some deliberate sin that I'm not repenting of. But whilst I'm in this household, I, I am, as it were, clothed with the righteousness which comes vicariously through Jesus Christ. Now I've tried to explain the, the, the whole, this whole question of, of, um, of um, our being, um, uh, thank you. Um, I, I've tried to explain this, this whole matter of um, why I believe that Jesus died for the sins of the world. Now, when I say the sins of the world, I'm not suggesting that the whole world is automatically excused from sin. I'm saying that the price that is paid covers everybody if they wish it. In other words, you don't have to accept it, but it's there. There is no limitation. That's why I say it, the Bible says he died, as, as John says, he died not for our sins only, meaning Christians, but for the whole world. In other words, there are many, many others who will come in and benefit from this, even though they may not be Christians, because he died for all. But there has to be, an, at some point in time, an acceptance of that price. Now, the other thing I wanted to e explain is the matter of uh, uh, God's um, uh, law. And I touched on it, that the law of God is, is so sacred that when God pronounces something, it must not return to him empty, as unfulfilled. So I'll read a passage from Isaiah, which I think Jews, Christians, and Muslims accept, as uh, we all accept Isaiah as a prophet of God. And here's what Isaiah says. Uh, he says, Seek the Lord while he may be found, Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return to the Lord and he will have compassion on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. Which is actually, in the original Hebrew, it would be Yahweh. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there without watering the earth and making it bare and sprout and furnishing seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be which goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. So you see, for that reason, we believe it was very important that God's law not be simply set aside, but fulfilled. Now Jesus said this of the Mosaic law. He said he hadn't come to destroy it, but to fulfill it. And he did this the same way. Actually, there were two laws here. Uh, there was the law of God given way back at the time of Adam, and that law was the sinner would die. But the Mosaic law had many other things added to it but no word of God could be set aside without being fulfilled. So, again, the explanation which the Bible gives is that Jesus didn't destroy that law, he actually fulfilled it. He fulfilled all parts of it. And that's why he had to be without sin. See, the Quran says that Jesus was born of a virgin, as the Bible does. But the Bible gives the reason for his, for his being born of a virgin. It wasn't simply an arbitrary act of God to have him born of a virgin. There was a very good reason why he had to be born of a virgin. The reason was that he had to be free from the inherited Adamic sin that the rest of the human race has. And again, the Bible gives a very good reason for that. Because it's the matter, the matter of ransom. 
in the illustration I gave, not one of those children would have been able to pay the fine of some other children because, first of all, they, 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 would, they didn't have the, the, fine, the money to pay the fine, but also they themselves were under the condemnation of the same amount, sometimes even more. So you can't go and pay a fine for somebody if you already owe the, that, that much money to, to, to the court. You could, you, you, you'd, have to, you'd have to pay your own fine first. Now the Bible deals with that problem in a very interesting way. And this is, again is from Psalms. And I was reading recently in, in the Quran. The Quran says that the Psalms were given to David by God. They are the word of truth. So think about this. I'm not reading from some foreign text. I'm reading from the Psalms which must surely be accepted by Jews and Christians and Muslims alike. Because as the Quran says, these Psalms were given by God to David. And this is what this Psalm says. It's a very important point on the matter of, of, of uh, uh, legality, the legality of, of um, uh, God's law not being set aside. It says, no man can by any means redeem his brother or give to God a ransom for him. For the redemption of his soul is costly and he should cease trying forever, that he should live on eternally, that he should not undergo decay. In other words, nobody can ransom. I can't ransom you, you can't ransom me. We can't prevent death from occurring because our soul is too costly. And the costliness of it is because of sin. That's why Jesus had to be born of a virgin so that he was not under the same condemnation of death as the rest of the human race. It, it was not an arbitrary act of God's part. And the Bible makes this very clear in other ways by saying that he was without sin. Without sin, meaning without the original sin of Adam. Now he could have sinned, that's the whole point. As a perfect man, like Adam, the second Adam in fact, as the Bible calls him, he could have sinned, but he didn't. And because he didn't, he was able to actually pay with his life, as we say with his blood, which is another way of saying his life, he was actually able to pay for the, the debt, you might say, of the whole human race. Now, how could that be? How could one die for all? But the Bible, again, deals with that very question. You see, in, again, this is, this is uh, Paul who's speaking, and what he says is in complete agreement with the rest of the Bible. But he, he clarifies it. He says, um, <clears throat> in, uh, in Second Corinthians, in the second uh, uh, letter to the Corinthians, in chapter three, having concluded this, that one died that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all, that they who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. So you see, this whole question is, by the one death, God counted that all had died. This, this is a very important point, and it's, it's, it's vital to the understanding of, the, of what we call the vicarious atonement, one person dying on behalf of the whole human race. Brothers and sisters, um, thank you. Uh, this is blatantly referring to Yeshua, that is the Messiah, who was the Son of God, by his stripes we are healed. In other words, the question here says that according to Isaiah 53, uh, Jesus, who is said to be the Son of God, is shown to be our healer. That by his stripes, in other words, by his sufferings, the rest of us are healed. So what is my response to that? Well, Isaiah 53 is a book that was written about, well, we should say to be safe, many hundred hundred years before Jesus and many Christians see what is described there in that book in this particular passage as a reference to Jesus and it seems to depict a man who is undergoing tremendous suffering 
and the passage says that this man is suffering for the rest of us and that through his suffering the rest of us are healed. Many Christians understand this to be a prediction that Jesus is going to come, that he's going to die on the cross for the sins of humankind. However, looking at the passage in context as we always do to get the accurate meaning, we derive actually a different meaning than that. The passage in Isaiah 53 is one of what the scholars of the Bible call four servant songs. They say there are four songs in the Bible which depict the servant of God suffering somehow. Now who exactly is this servant of God that is being spoken of here? Many different names have been proposed of different individuals over time. Most of the scholars, however, feel that the servant here is not an individual, but the whole Israelite nation altogether. Now, the puzzling part of that is that the passages seem to refer to an individual. For example, it says, by his stripes we are healed. And it says that it pleased God to bruise him, for example. It's always speaking about an individual, it would seem. However, the scholars of the Hebrew Bible point out that in the Hebrew text, often the whole Israelite nation is personalized as though, as though it is one person. So that God could say, for example, Israel is my son, referring to the whole Israelite nation as though it is just one man. Well, many of you would know this also from your own writings. If you're writing poetry, for example, it would be easy for you to speak about inanimate objects as though they think like human beings. For example, you might speak about the wind being angry, as though the wind has human feelings. You're speaking about the wind as having uh, emotions. Uh, you, know, you might be familiar with the story Animal Farm in which the characters are all animals, but they think and act like human beings, for example. So you have different styles of writing. In the Hebrew Bible, often the style is adopted where the whole Israelite nation is spoken of as though it is one individual. So these four passages, which are called four servant songs, are said by the scholars to refer not to Jesus, but to the whole Israelite nation. And what makes this identification even more certain is that in some of the passages, it specifically says, my servant Israel, for example, in Isaiah chapter 49. So scholars are quite sure that the servant who is mentioned here is not Jesus, but the Israelite nation. So this then, although it looks like it is a prediction about a man undergoing deep suffering for others, they say this is actually the suffering of the Israelite nation, which they felt was a vicarious suffering for other people. And uh, that is their answer. So this by itself cannot show that Jesus died for the sins of the world, according to my understanding. Special. Then that means he has no father. If we look at the birth of Adam, who has no father and no mother, that makes him more greater than Jesus. A comment about that. And second one, the whole world believes that new baby born without a sin. New baby is born without a sin. How then could Jesus, peace be upon him, die for peoples who have committed sin, who have not committed sin? Okay, thank you. Uh, I just want to make a, a brief, brief comment about Isaiah 53, which Javier mentioned. I, I'm well aware that uh, it's particularly, when I say scholars, I would say it's um, perhaps Jewish scholars, the rabbis, uh, I, I found to be somewhat embarrassed by this text, because here's the interesting thing. Uh, obviously, Christians didn't put this into the Bible. It wasn't written by Christians. It was written by Jews, by, by Isaiah hundreds of years before the birth of Christ Jesus. So, uh, it's, it's, but it's there in their Bible. Now the question is, could this be the nation of Israel? But when we examine it, point by point, we see this really couldn't be the nation of Israel. For instance, in chapter 53 verse 9 it says, His grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death. 
because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. Now, no way can you study the history of Israel as a nation and say, no, there was no deceit, no violence. On the contrary, God was constantly sending his prophets to warn them of their violence, their wickedness, and their apostasy. So this really could be the nation of Israel. I pointed this out one time to a Jewish rabbi, and he, he kind of threw up his hands and said, well, uh, yes, well, maybe that point doesn't, but, but the rest of it does. Well, the point is you can't take bits and, bits and pieces out and say that it, it's, it, 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 it fits. It does fit Jesus because there was no violence in him. There was no deceit. But I don't think you uh, apply it to the nation of Israel. And there are many other points here. Now, it is true that very often the nation of Israel is referred to as God's servant. Uh, for instance, there's a passage in Hosea which says, when Israel was a boy, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. And there he's referring to the whole nation as a single individual. In the same way, the whole Christian congregation is sometimes referred to as a bride, with Jesus being the bridegroom, and the whole Christian congregation, or perhaps hundreds of thousands or millions of people, being a single individual, a single bride, metaphorically. That's true. Uh, in, in, um, in the book of Ephesians, Paul speaks of the Jews and the Gentiles being brought together and created as one new man, meaning the, the Christian church at that time. So there are many, many examples of this, but that doesn't mean to say every time we, we read it, we have to assume that it's a whole nation. The context will tell us this, and I would say the context of this and the actual words really preclude it from being the whole nation, because as I say, the nation, it could not be said of the nation that it had done no violence. Indeed, they were constantly in violence and constantly wicked, and there was very much deceit in the, na in the nation as a whole. That's why they were sold into slavery. That's the very thing that happened, you see. And it wasn't the nation that was... The other problem is to say the nation was punished for the nation. In other words, by the, this, this, whoever this is, and he says he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Well, that could be the nation, crushed for the nation, for the, for, for the, uh, uh, for the, uh, uh, the sins of the, the, the nation. That, that could be so. But it certainly wouldn't be so that, he was, that, he, that uh, the nation didn't open his mouth. My goodness, they, they certainly complained very much when they were taken off into captivity. So and, and I, I really find this uh, really impossible to, to equate with the nation. Furthermore, in the book of Acts itself, now remember the book of Acts was written by Luke, which was one of the Gospels. You see, we think of the book of Acts being a separate book, but originally the book of Acts and what we call the Gospel of Luke were one single book. There were on two scrolls, there wasn't enough room to put them all on one scroll, but they were all, they were simply part one and part two of the same thing. Later on they were separated. Luke unquestionably wrote the, the book of Acts, and it's in the book of Acts that we read of how one of the very early Christians used this very text to prove that Jesus was the Messiah. That was the very text to use. Also, in the Gospels, again, you, to refer to the Injil, this very text is quoted, parts of it, uh, 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 and applied to Jesus. So rather than the opinion of scholars, of Jewish scholars, who are somewhat embarrassed by this text, I would go to the Injil itself, the actual Gospels, and say, what did the Gospels say about this? And they apply this text, or parts of it, quotations from this very text, to Jesus particularly in the part, for instance, of his not opening his mouth. But the other question I decided I mean to answer, was it this one? Oh. He was without a father and a mother, doesn't he? Isn't he greater than Jesus? Well, it's interesting that both, the only two humans who are actually called the sons of God in the Bible are Adam and Jesus. And I want to clarify something here. Which, which seems to be a lot of confusion, particularly amongst Muslims. When we say, or when the Bible says that somebody is the son of God, that does not mean that God sired that person or begot him in the sense of having to have sexual intercourse somehow. That's ridiculous. I don't know of any Christian or Jew who would believe that. We 
often speak of God in human uh, terms, once we speak of the mouth of God, the ears of God, the eyes of God, but we don't imagine, at least I think more intelligent of us, don't believe that God has literal eyes as we have them, or literal ears as we have them. These are only ways that we can visualize, not visualize God in a, in a literal sense, but we can speak of his activities. Now, when we say that somebody has, is the father of something, for instance, I was reading recently of somebody who's called the father of aeronautics. Well, how was he the father of aeronautics? Because he brought it into being. That's In that sense, he was the father. Clearly, God, uh, the, the Bible tells us that God created Adam from the dust of the earth. It was an act of creation, not of sexual procreation. God didn't, didn't procreate him. He created him from the dust of the earth. And Adam is called the son of God, going back to the genealogy of Jesus. The only other person that's called the son of God is Jesus himself. And once again, it's, an, it's not by procreation. It's, it's by God bringing him into existence. And I don't know how God did this, but in that sense, in bringing him into the, into the womb of Mary, he, he brings him into existence. And in that sense, he is called the father of Jesus. It has nothing to do with begettal in, in the normal sense. And it has no, it, it doesn't make one greater than the other. Jesus, as I said, is called the second Adam. He's the replacement. He's the new father of human race. We've all inherited a sinner. Uh, we descended from a sinful man, a uh, one who rebelled or sinned against God. That's all our inheritance. God is now creating another, a new human race with a new father in Jesus Christ. And it's not to say one is greater than the other because they're both creations of God. So does God create something inferior? I would say not. I would say because it's a creation of God, it's got to be perfect. Um, the other question I think, there was a, um, a, a uh, yeah, the question is the whole world believes that a new baby born without sin. How then could Jesus die for people who have not committed sin? Well. Again, in the book of Psalms, David, by inspiration, says, In sin I was born. In, in sin did my mother conceive me. David clearly shows that sin is actually starts right at conception. We are born with it. Now, it's, it's not that the baby sins, but rather has the tendency to sin, as born with that is in a sense born under the condemnation of sin, of being right with him. But this is a very good question. I, I, I can see how the confusion would arise because is sin sin before it's committed? Well, the Bible says that it's, we're actually conceived that way. We're part of the human race. And that's why he had to die for the whole human race. But I don't believe for a moment that babies are condemned. You know, at, and during the heyday of the Roman Catholic Church, they used to make sure that every baby, every stillborn baby, was baptized whilst it was still in the womb. Now, they did that with a certain instrument to actually baptize the baby, as they said, or sprinkle it with water. And that is ridiculous because God does not condemn babies. We, we are condemned by, there has to be a rejection or an acceptance at some point of God's provision. Uh, Mr. Forward's comment. Uh, first, on Isaiah 52, also in Bible commentaries, which are actually sold in Christian bookstores. It, uh, it's a commentary that's not only given by people who do not believe in the Christian message, but a commentary which seems necessitated by the very words of the Bible. It says, my servant Israel. So the name of the servant is also given. Furthermore, in Isaiah chapter 42, it says that the servant is blind and deaf, meaning that it does not want to listen to the message. And that seems obviously to fit the servant Israel, uh, knowing the history as it is given in the Bible itself, but it doesn't seem to fit Jesus. Now, can we say that uh, Jesus had no violence and no deceit in his mouth? Well, Muslims would definitely say absolutely. They believe Jesus to be the Messiah, a prophet, a messenger of God. However, if a Christian was to honestly go by his own Bible, 
we would see that actually Jesus at times did use some perhaps measured violence. Say on one occasion, actually it must have been two occasions, he went into the temple and drove out the money changers, overturned their tables and he was using a whip of cords. Uh, what about deceit? Well, I, I don't want to make too big of a point about this, but again if a Christian was going by the Bible itself, uh, they would find something there that Muslims uh, would not subscribe to. We would not say that this is necessarily authentic. But there was an occasion when Jesus uh, told his brothers he's not going up to the feast and then later on he went secretly. Uh, some of the scribes were not too comfortable with that rendering and so they changed it to make it read that I'm not yet going up to the feast so that later on when he goes there appears, there appears to be no problem. And uh, we can see in the footnoting of modern Bibles that it is noted that some of the scribes had this extra wording, not yet. So that instead of just saying... Thank you. I have a question uh, for Shabir Ali. According to the Christians, Faith. Jesus died for uh, died for our sins about 2,000 years ago. Since now, sins they are now increasing. They are not decreasing. Does that mean God has to send Jesus, peace be upon him, again and again and again to wipe out the sins? Well, if we say that Jesus died once and for all for all of the sins to come, well then. It uh, would mean that there is no need anymore for Jesus to die again. And it would also mean that God can no longer penalize people for their sins because it's already paid for. If I give a blank check to the brick for any, everything that would be purchased up until the year 3000, it means that no matter what people go and purchase, all of that is already paid for. The brick can no longer go and claim the price from someone. To use Mr. Foward's example, if I go as a good man to the court and pay for all of the fines that anyone would incur, well then the court can no longer go and uh, penalize the very people whose uh, things are already paid for. And uh, furthermore, and the more important point is this, that the person who has done any good to the people is the one who paid the fine, not the one who received it. In this case, nobody should thank the court or the authorities because the authorities did nothing, they just simply collected the money. And uh, in that case then, we should thank the one who paid the price for us. But if the price is paid once and for all, then God can no longer turn around and penalize anyone else for the crime. Thank you. I'll give you a couple of minutes to make a comment. Thank you. This is, this is a very interesting uh, theological point that Shabir has raised. What I was trying to explain in the example I gave, I thought I made it clear that when I said a blank check, that the check was to cover those transgressions that were done inadvertently, not deliberately. I do not believe that a person can claim to be a Christian, to be, as we say, under the blood of Christ, and go out and murder and rape and kill, and not receive the condemnation of God. The Bible is very, very specific about that. It says that fornicators and murderers and men who lie with men and others homosexual, all these things will not inherit God's kingdom. Now, if you don't inherit God's kingdom, what do you inherit? You inherit death. Because the Bible says the wage of sin is death, the gift of God is everlasting life, or life uh, age abiding, actually, into, in, in, uh, into the eons. So there was a very distinct, I did not want to even suggest that uh, deliberate sins are paid for by the blood of Christ. I, what I said was that all past sins are completely forgiven and wiped out and once we enter into God's household, we come under a new arrangement. And that arrangement requires that we not be deliberately wicked. So, now the, the other, the other um, uh, point that was raised was, as far as uh, sins um, uh, were concerned, it's the, the sins are paid for if, if one accepts it. You know, you don't have to accept God's arrangement. And as for the, the, the one who died, being greater, more generous than one than, than God who, who forgave, 
the Bible makes it clear it was God who made the gift. That's why it says God loved the world so much, the world of mankind, he gave his unique son that whoever would believe in him would not perish. So if God was the giver, and I always want to emphasize that, this was a generous gift of God, which I didn't, I didn't mention in my illustration. Thank you. <clears throat> a question for you now. It's a, in the Christian religion mentioned that and indicated that Jesus, peace be upon him, his only begotten son. Then what about Adam? First of all, I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat, uh, there's a problem with this expression, only begotten. I think there are a number of translations that render that as the unique Son of God. But in any case, Adam was also a unique Son in that he was directly created by God. And that's why I said he is the only one other than the Bible who's called the Son of God in that sense. There are only two in the whole Bible that are called that. And I just want to make one thing very clear. Somebody wrote a question, and I want to just answer it very briefly. Somebody asked the question, did, um, I said that they misunderstood me as saying that God removed uh, certain things from the Bible, kept them out. I said, no, he didn't remove them, he kept them out. They never got in in the first place. That was the point I was making. There were certain expressions and ideas that the surrounding nations uh, had, uh, and they, those, those ideas never got into the Bible. So it's, it's not a question of removing them afterwards. God didn't make any mistakes. He never allowed those things in the Bible in the first place. Thank you. I'm joining a couple of questions here for you, Shabir. Is it possible for a child to be a grandson and at the same time to be a grandfather why Jesus is the son of God and the Lord of the world at the same time and then he died for the people now that's part of the question the question is if you say that Jesus is God or if someone says that Jesus is God and God died who is controlling the universe all right, well, these are very important questions and they illustrate a certain amount of confusion uh, with due respect to my friend Paul. I think I noticed the same thing too. When you speak, uh, on one moment you want to say that God sent Jesus, but then you become uncomfortable with that and then you say God came himself. He made a body for himself or he assumed flesh and he came. Because if you say that he sent his son, Although Mr. Fowler has spoken of this as a gift, the sun is not an inanimate object like a book or, or like a piece of wood or something. You have a thinking, rational individual who has a mind and will of his own. When you're giving him as a gift, you're not just giving him, you're handing him over to be crucified. So you have to imagine God putting his son on the cross, nailing the son on the cross, making sure the thorns grow on his head so that his head would bleed. The son is up there stifling for breath, he cannot breathe. He's naked on the cross, no painter wants to depict him naked because that would look awful. How would you put a naked man like that on the cross in our churches? So you don't want to understand the full gravity of the fact that Jesus is on the cross. Now, when a man is on the cross for many hours and he wants to go to the bathroom, they don't take him down to go to the bathroom. He makes the arch right there in the sky, in front of all of the people. There are flies, there is a smell of blood and so on. Everything is there. So is God doing that for his, to his son? Is that the gift that he is giving us? I would say, God, please, I don't want that gift. Put me on the cross and let my brother Jesus go. I would rather die for my prophet than my prophet dies for me. That's not the kind of gift that we should be happy that God gave us. Why did God give it this way? Why didn't he just forgive, forgive the people? He could have. Because in the end, you say the same thing anyhow. You say that God forgave the people, don't you? So if he could forgive after the son paid, he could forgive even before the son paid. God is not like the judges of this world who is working for somebody else. If he makes a mistake, he loses his job. 
God doesn't report to anyone else. He reports to himself. So if he decides to let the people go, nobody's going to come and ask him, God, but wait a minute, why do you let the people go? Okay, you're fired. You see? So God has the prerogative and the authority to forgive us. That's why he forgives us in his own way. Thank you. Mr. Forward, what is the fate of those millions who died before Jesus? Peace be upon him. What's their fate before Jesus came? And what's the fate of those who will die after him? Are they considered sinners? Is there a place in hell for them? So before and after. Thank you. I love these questions, they're so good. Um, <clears throat> I am something of a heretic here because, you see, I believe, I do not believe that a person is automatically lost. Uh, I have to explain here the difference between people usually think the opposite of being saved is to be lost. That's not so. The opposite of being saved is unsaved. To give an illustration, you imagine a ship that's sinking and a whole lot of people swimming to the shore. The ones who reach the shore are saved. The ones who've drowned are lost. But the ones still in the sea who have not yet reached the shore and haven't drowned, they're neither saved nor lost, they're simply unsaved. And I would say the majority of mankind is in that position of being unsaved, not lost. So I disagree here with many of my Christian brothers who think that a person is automatically lost. Now to answer the question specifically, what about those who lived before Jesus? Well, the Bible makes it very clear there were very many men of faith and they met, they're mentioned and they're familiar to the um, Muslim world as they are to the, to the Christian and Jewish world. These names such as uh, Abraham, uh, um, Joshua, uh, Moses. All these men, it says, they died in faith, not receiving the promises. Isn't that interesting? They did not receive the promises because God saw something better for us, that they, these men of faith, would not be made perfect apart from us, separate from us. And I believe the Bible is very clear that all rewards come at the time of the resurrection. We do not receive rewards before that. And Jesus makes this very, very clear. And, I, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm getting into myself into problems now with, with the Christian world rather than the Muslim world in saying this. But, I, but if anybody wants to argue, then they can argue with Jesus because he says this in, in Luke chapter 14. You might want to make a note of it. In Luke 14, um, verse, starting, at, starting at verse 12, he says, he went to the same. When you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers, your relatives, or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return, repayment come to you. This is Jesus speaking now. But when you give a, a reception, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed, since they do not have the means to repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. It's a very clear statement. Repayment comes the resurrection of the righteous. That includes all those who lived before, all the faithful men who lived before, and all those who are faithful today. It's at the resurrection of the righteous. And it's not any, this is not a, a piecemeal resurrection. The Bible speaks of a time, a day of resurrection. So I believe this will, will, will happen. So I, I, I think that that applies to those who lived before and those who live now. And I, and I would, would want to make one, I know my time's up, but there's one very important point here. The Apostle Paul says that those who did not have the law, but did the things of the law, demonstrated the law to be written on their hearts. He says they will be either accused or excused, or their conscience will either accuse or excuse them on that day when God judges the secret things of men's hearts. Do you hear what he's saying? they will be either accused or excused. Paul doesn't say because they didn't have the law, they're automatically condemned. If they did the things of the law and it was written on their hearts, they will, their conscience will either accuse or excuse them on that day when God judges the secret things of men's hearts. And I believe that. 
Thank you. No, sorry, sorry. It's okay. Brothers, uh, make the question, please, uh, more readable. Now, I was born in the desert, and English is my second language, so please print clearly. Thank you. Okay, we have a question here. Brother Shabir, uh, Reverend claimed that Paul does not contradict the scriptures, and uh, you could comment on the rest. Thank you. So to read the question fully, uh, the Reverend claimed that Paul doesn't contradict the scriptures. Would you please explain the book of Jonah, that is the prophecy, Jesus himself being alive in the belly of the earth and the subsequent events at the sepulcher and the upper room. All right, well, the, the main point here is about, Jesus, about Paul and whether indeed he contradicted the rest of the scriptures. Uh, I think he did, and uh, many scholars have actually admitted that. It is quite uh, popularly known. For example, a recent book written by uh, a well-known scholar entitled Paul, a mind, the, the Mind of the Apostle, uh, actually bears out this point. But you don't need that book. You can go to the Bible itself and you can see that Jesus usually says one thing and Paul says the other thing. For example, Jesus in Matthew chapter 5 verses 19 and 20 says that every law is still in place. And he said, I have not come to abolish the law. But uh, Paul in his letter to the Ephesians in chapter 2 verse 14 said that Jesus abolished the law. Uh, Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish. Paul said, he abolished. So Paul does sometimes say something other than what Jesus said. This is only one example of such, an, uh, uh, such a happening. Now, the, the thing about Jonah is that according to the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 12, verse 40, Jesus said, as Jonah was in the belly of the whale three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the belly of the earth three days and three nights. Well, we know from the sequence of events given in the Gospels that Jesus was not in the belly of the earth three days and three nights. The most he could have been were two days and, uh, or two nights and one day, because he was buried late on the Friday. Uh, so we have the Friday night, so we have the Saturday night. By Sunday morning, he was gone. And in between, we only have one day. If you stretch it the most you can, you can get perhaps uh, th uh, three days and two nights. But you cannot get three days and three nights. So uh, many scholars have admitted that this is an incorrect statement in the Bible. In the Abingdon uh, commentary on the Bible, it says that this is a gloss, which means it is a mistake inserted by a scribe that it couldn't have been something that Jesus actually said. Thank you. Reverend uh, Forward, we have a question here regarding, regards, oh, you want to comment? Okay. Okay. Well, I want to to. okay, you comment. Yeah. Yeah. I must make a, one correction here. I refer to as reverend. I, I don't like this term because I'm not a reverend. I'm, I am a, a Bible scholar. But the term reverend is only used in the Bible once and it refers to God. So I consider it uh, very inappropriate for any man to be called reverend and I will not call anybody reverend, and certainly not myself. So please don't refer to me as that. I much prefer to refer to by, by my Christian name, which is Clifford. Um, the, uh, the, I, I think we have to be careful here when we quote scholars, because many of these scholars, so-called, contradict themselves, they contradict even the virgin birth, which would be contradicting the Quran as well. So I personally uh, do not place a lot of faith in some of the modern scholars. They are questioning everything. They question whether Jesus even lived. Uh, I uh, would say that uh, the, the, the modern scholarship, there are there, there certain very liberal scholars who have doubt it, just about everything. Um, in the turn of the century, the number of German scholars who were quite certain that Luke uh, wrote his gospel in the second century, not, not in anywhere near the time of the events. And they pointed to a number of historical inaccuracies in his account. And, they, and for instance, he names certain rulers and gives them a name and we know from historical records they weren't the rulers at the time supposedly but then you see now it turns out through modern scholarship through archaeology that Luke was absolutely right that the scholars were wrong they were relying upon so-called historical uh, evidence but uh, 
the, the historical evidence was negated, contradicted by the archaeological evidence. And Luke has been proven to be absolutely accurate over and over again in the most extraordinary way. So I wouldn't put too much faith in what scholars say because they change from time to time. Thank you. You say that the Bible is the book of God. Then you say that God inspired the 40 authors to remove what did belong, what didn't belong there. I wrote that thing, you know, that God. So to remove the thing that it didn't and to put with the thing that he did. Uh, does that mean that God made mistakes in, the, in choosing his words? Yes, I, this was such an important question, I thought I answered it earlier without actually reading it. Uh, I didn't say that God removed anything, I said he kept it out, which is quite different. I said that he never allowed into the Bible certain expressions that would absolutely contradict what he'd previously written. So I, uh, I didn't say, uh, I'm sure if you, if you go back on the tape, you say, I did not say he removed anything, I said he kept it out, not took it out. It's quite different. It was never allowed in the first place. So God certainly did not make any mistakes. And I believe that the Bible is in fact the word of God in the sense that God caused it to be inspired, written down, and he used these various men as secretaries, as it were. Now these men often have, these 40 different authors, have their own individual styles. Uh, we can detect the styles of their writing we can detect their background, but what they say is essentially the same. Uh, there is no contradiction in the, co in the context. And I just wanted to, to deal very briefly with what uh, Shabir uh, said about the contradiction of Paul and Jesus. It's true, Jesus said he didn't come to abolish the law, Paul says he did abolish it, but we have to read that in context. What Jesus is referring to is simply abolishing the law as he did, you see, uh, he, many people saw him because of the way he spoke, that he could simply contradict the law and set it aside. He never did that. For instance, he was accused of breaking the Sabbath. He never broke the Sabbath, not even once. He, what he did, he healed on the Sabbath. He did the works of God on the Sabbath, which in the mind of some of the Jews, the leaders at that time, any sort of activity was breaking the Sabbath. Jesus pointed out this was not so. He, does, well, he was not breaking the Sabbath, he was breaking their rules, which is something quite different. Their rules, not God's. But he did not come to arbitrarily set the law aside. He fulfilled it by dying. And when you read what Paul says in the full context, Paul shows that he did that. He, he put the law aside, as it were, by fulfilling it. He agrees with Jesus. But abolished, the, uh, the effect was to put it aside or to abolish it, but not in the way that some would uh, assume at the, when Jesus was speaking. So we have to read those two, two statements in, in, in context. Thank you. Two minutes for the Shabir to comment on that. Well, I must start off by saying, um, Mr. Fowler, I don't understand your answer, because on the one hand, You've agreed that uh, the, uh, Jesus said he did not come to abolish, and Paul said that he did abolish. Now you said that the two things appear opposite, but they are not opposite because they have two different meanings. But the meanings which you explain doesn't seem to be any different. Uh, it, it is still quite clear that Jesus, from what he said, it made it plain that he didn't come to abolish the law. He kept the Sabbath. He still insisted the law should be kept. And on the other hand, Paul taught people that uh, the law is abolished. Uh, so in what sense then is it different? I'll, I'll have you explain that a little bit further and then I can respond because I didn't understand your answer. Again, perhaps I can give an illustration. If I have, if I'm fined, say, for a parking ticket, which does sometimes happen to me, I can simply say, tear up the ticket, and in a sense I've set it aside, I haven't fulfilled it. But if I pay the fine, or somehow 
allow, uh, uh, perhaps go to court and plead that I wasn't there at the time when the ticket was written, whatever. I have not abolished what was there. I haven't just arbitrarily set it aside. I have fulfilled it by paying the fine or proving my innocence. But in another sense, speaking in another sense, I could say later on, well, that's put aside. And we have to be very careful, as I say, by the context. Paul is not contradicting Jesus by saying he abolished the law. Paul makes it very clear. For instance, what Paul says is something that Jesus also says. See, Jesus said he came to, uh, to uh, create a new covenant. Now, that prophecy about the new covenant was, was prophesied hundreds of years before Jesus came to the earth. It was a prophecy given by Jeremiah. And it was God through Jeremiah who said that he would, he would uh, write a new covenant and, and put uh, all of us really, but he starts with of course with the nation of Israel by putting them under a new covenant. And uh, he says um, uh, in, um, in Jeremiah 30, 33, I believe it is, he, he says um, uh, the days uh, uh, thus says the Lord, if you break my covenant for the day and my covenant for the night, so that day and night will not be at their appointed time. Then he says, um, uh, the days will come, he says, when I will have a new covenant with the house of Israel, not according to the old covenant which you, which you uh, previously broke. He said, I'll write my law in your hearts. Now, this, this was something which Jesus refers to because on the night of his betrayal, he, is, he refers to that new covenant. He says, this is given to you for the new covenant. He refers to it. Now, why is he speaking of a new covenant? Because he knows very well that the old covenant is set aside. You see, you can't have two covenants in existence. The new covenant says the older side. I have the same situation with a mortgage. I had a mortgage in my house. I sold the house and had a new mortgage. But when I, the new mortgage set the old one aside. I, wasn't, I, I didn't have two mortgages on the same house. The old one was set aside by the new. So Jesus clearly indicates that there would be a putting aside of the old covenant, the old Mosaic law. Paul simply explains in detail how that is done. He says in, in, um, in, in Ephesians chapter 2, he says this, he says, he says, remember that you at that time, speaking of the Gentiles, separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strange to the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one, broke down the barrier of the dividing wall, by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace. So it was the enmity of the law that was abolished. And it's true, he, Jesus did, in one sense, abolish it, but, he, but what I tried to explain was he did not abolish it in the sense of simply arbitrarily putting it aside. He fulfilled it, and in that way he abolished it or put it aside. Uh, the, 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 the two, in other words, there are two ways of abolishing. One simply by setting it aside without doing anything. The other affecting the abolishment by fulfillment. Thank you. Now for my response. It is clear that uh, after hearing the... Uh, Mr. Forward's answer a second time that we're nowhere different than where we started. It is quite obvious that Jesus said one thing and Paul said the other thing. Jesus said, I have not come to abolish. Paul said he did abolish. From what Mr. Forward has explained, Jesus did not abolish the law at all. Uh, he insisted that it must be kept. He said that you must keep every one of the commandments, big or small. It is possible also to have two covenants. Yes, you can also have two mortgages on a house. You can have a first and you can have a second. The passage from Jeremiah does not say that the first commandment will be abolished at all. 
uh, it speaks about a new commandment coming into effect, but it doesn't say the first one will be abolished or will be cancelled. So when Jesus said, I'm instituting a new covenant, uh, that has to be taken in line with what Jesus already said, meaning that the old commandment is still valid. He said, whoever will break even one of the smallest of these laws and teach others to do the same will be called smallest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever will practice any one of these commandments will be called greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus maintained circumcision. He maintained the distinction between clean and unclean foods. But Paul did not maintain this distinction. Paul said circumcision doesn't matter and uncircumcision doesn't matter. Paul said you can eat what you want because all foods are clean. Whereas Jesus and his disciples after him maintained that distinction. Yes, Jesus said one thing and Paul did say the other thing. Even after hearing Mr. Foward's answer for the second time, I am still convinced that this is the case. Paul said that Jesus broke, according to what Mr. Foward has just read, Jesus, sorry, that Jesus abolished the law with all its commandments and regulations. On the other hand, we know that Jesus kept the commandments and regulations according to what Mr. Foward himself had admitted before. Thank you. Uh, brothers, uh, respected guests, uh, sisters, please keep uh, the questions on the same topic. Did Jesus, peace be upon him, die for the sins of the Lord? Because we have all kinds of questions that does not really go align with the subject. Okay, just uh, let's just browse through this one. Was Jesus a Jew or non-Jew? What color was he? Well, Jesus was clearly a Jew, and he had to be a Jew. He, he, he's called, by the way, uh, he, he's never in the Bible called the son of Mary. He's called the son of David. And it was very important that he be a descendant of David. So he was certainly a Jew of the tribe of Judah, by the way, which is what the word Jew comes from that, because he was of the tribe of Judah. Uh, so I, I certainly... Uh, uh, would say that uh, he was a Jew most definitely. And just one other very brief point in reply to what Shabir said. The, uh, Jesus certainly did not break any of the commandments because he was under the law which was in effect until his own death. It was his own death that made it possible to put aside the law. And I want to make one other point very clear. There was a covenant given to Abraham which was unconditional. There were no conditions on that covenant. Then 430 years later, God gives another law to Moses, which is clearly conditional. And Paul asks this, he says, why would God do this? Why was it that he would do this? Because even in human terms, you don't add a codicil to someone. You've got a covenant, it remains that way. Why would 430 years later, God add something to, the, to, that, to that clause or, or put clauses in it? And Paul says it was to sh in order to show that we are sinners and that it was necessary to have a redeemer. That's his explanation for it. You say that the Bible doesn't call Jesus son of Mary? Is that what I heard you say? I understand that he's, he's, uh, he's in, in, when, in, when he's referred to, uh, sorry, um, uh, my understanding is that when he's referred to, uh, in the Bible, he's referred to as son of David. People call out to him and say, son of David, for instance, have mercy upon me. Um, I, I, but as, as, a, as a designation, clearly he is called the son of Mary in that he is shown to be of Mary, I, but I meant as a designation, a way of addressing him. They wouldn't, uh, people at that time didn't say, oh Jesus, son of Mary, as far as I know. Um, but clearly he is shown to be the son of Mary in the Bible, yes. Yes, I was thinking the same. There is at least one passage in the Gospel of Mark where uh, the people remarked, isn't this the carpenter, Jesus, the son of Mary? Uh, so they did call him the son of Mary, though as Mr. Foward has rightly said, uh, I, there is no place where they addressed him as, as such, calling him son of Mary to get his attention. Uh, but there, it is also obvious that there was a move to stop referring to Jesus in this particular way. Matthew's Gospel, which was written some uh, decade and a half after uh, Mark's Gospel, changed the very speech of the people, so that whereas the people had said, isn't this Jesus, the carpenter, the son of Mary, uh, Matthew changed it to read, isn't this Jesus, the son of the carpenter? So in other words, they made his father the carpenter, and they made him the son of his father, and they no longer 
uh, refer to him so much as the son of Mary. So the move to stop referring to him in that way and to introduce new titles was definitely there. But we, we still, with this problem about whether or not Jesus and Paul contradicted each other, if Jesus really instituted a new covenant with his death and that canceled the old, then when he spoke initially, he should have said that I came to abolish the law. Because that's what he will do eventually. But he said, I didn't come to abolish the law. And Paul said he did. So no amount of explanation, I think, is going to escape this point. No, even if you say that Jesus abolished it with his death, and he came to die for the sins of the world, then you're saying that he came to abolish. But he said, I didn't come to abolish. So we should admit that Paul said something different when he said that Jesus did abolish the law with all its commandments and uh, regulations. Thank you. Brother Shabir, this is the question, says to brother, say the Bible only two sons, or there is two sons in the Bible, sons of God. And then see over, says only Jesus is sinless. Is there anyone else sinless? So it means, is there anyone else who is son of God that is mentioned in the Bible, right? Only two. And there's, is there anyone else that's mentioned that's sinless? Now, according to the Bible, there are many who are called sons of God, including Jesus, including David, including Adam. In fact, in one place, it, it, David is called the begotten son of God. God says, this is my son, this day I have begotten you, uh, in reference to David, in the second Psalm, verse number 7. Uh, so calling someone son of God in the Bible does not mean that he is divine, does not mean that he is different than a human being, it just means that this is a person who is righteous and God is making special mention of that. Apparently, this is the language that people used. Muslims today will not use that language because now the title Son of God is uh, connected with so much of theology that has been built up over the ages and decided upon in church councils and so on. But uh, to call someone Son of God in the Bible is nothing new. In fact, uh, Jesus is reported to have said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Here we're talking about sons by the tons. In fact, uh, according to the Bible, Jesus said to his followers, Do not call anyone on earth your father, because you have only one father who is in heaven. So, speaking to the disciples in general, Jesus can say, Your father is in heaven. So, the idea that Jesus is the unique son still has to be explained in what sense. Mr. Foward said, not in the biological sense, as though he had sex with a woman. But then, if you read the Gospel according to Luke, you will see where the popular understanding of people um, has come from. It, uh, actually, the Gospel of Luke says that when Mary was to become pregnant, the angel said to her that the power of God will come upon you and the Holy Spirit will overshadow you so that that will truly be born in you will be called the Holy One, the Son of God. And uh, this seems to paint a rather graphic image. We're delighted that the Quran has uh, set the record straight by telling us that the angel said to Mary, uh, that is the will of God. When God decrees a thing, he only says to it, be, and it is. We don't need this imagery about all of this coming upon you and overshadowing you and all of that. Uh, so. Jesus, on whom be peace, is the Messiah, he's a servant, he's the messenger of God, he was born in a miraculous way by the power uh, of God, by just God giving the word, and Jesus is shaped in the, womb, uh, in the womb of his mother. And God says in the glorious Quran, he is the one who shapes you in the wombs of your mother. So who shaped Jesus? It would have been his God. Thank you. Maybe this is the last question we will answer or we will uh, uh, browse through which is not on our topic to forward. Do you think or do you believe that the Quran is a word of God? It's uh, a very tricky question. Um, well, I guess I, my feeling about the Quran is perhaps the same, towards the Quran is perhaps the same as Shabir's towards the Bible. Clearly, Shabir believes that, that uh, the Bible contains a lot of truth, but he doesn't believe all of the Bible is from God. I'm in the same position with the Quran. I believe that the Quran contains a lot of truth. 
In fact, I find truth in many, many things. There, there are the, even truth in what I read today from the, from the Arabian poet, absolutely true. But in order for a thing to be of God, it must be without any error, no error at all. And I find things in the Quran which I would say, for me personally, would preclude it as being really from God. Now, that's a question which we have to resolve. Uh, one, one such question, for instance, the Quran speaks of people being tortured in hell for all eternity. And I know many Christians believe this. But I don't believe that this is, this is taught. I cannot reconcile this with the Bible teaching that the wage of sin is death, that those who sin go into the lake of fire, as does hell and death. So clearly this has to be metaphorical. You can't put death into a literal fire, obviously. What could you do with death? Try burning it sometime, you'll see how futile it is. But metaphorically, you can put death into the lake of fire, and death itself then is no more. It's a way fire is simply a symbol of total destruction. So I find contradictions between the Bible and the Quran. And if I'm to believe the Bible, I find I cannot, that is if I believe all of the Bible, I cannot believe all of the Qur'an. But there are many things in the Qur'an which I absolutely agree with. And I would be very happy to, 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 to quote those things which I do agree with, which I think are absolutely 100% true. Thank you. One minute comment. I think the point uh, on which uh, Mr. Forward hesitates to accept the Qur'an, as he has said, is this question about people being tormented in hell forever. He thinks that the Bible disagrees with that and he would like to hold on to the Bible and reject the Qur'an on that basis. Uh, well, other things considered, actually I think the Bible does agree with that because in Revelation chapter 20 verse 14 for example, we read about some of God's creatures, the beast, the false prophet and those who followed the false prophet being thrown into the lake of sulfur and the Bible says therein they will be tormented forever. So I think uh, Mr. Forward can, on this particular point, accept both the Bible and the glorious Qur'an. And I invite you to accept the glorious Qur'an. And all of you folks, I invite you, men and women, to accept that book because that today is the only way to be saved. Thank you. Would you like to comment? Allahu Akbar. Allahu Do you like to comment? Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, Shabir has mentioned the one one scripture, one point in the in the Bible where it speaks of those being in the lake of fire being tormented forever and ever. And as I pointed out, into that lake of fire also death and Hades are cast. And obviously you can't torture or punish death. You can destroy it, you can remove it as something, uh, as, as an evil from the universe. And this agrees with other parts of the Bible and says the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Death is our enemy. So, uh, the Bible has different ways of, exp of expressing this total annihilation of death. But when we look at the Bible, we have to make sure that, that one part of the Bible is agreeing with another. And I have found the most useful method of Bible study is to allow the Bible to interpret itself. Now, in Daniel, it says that many of those who sleep, they are asleep, in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to everlasting shame and contempt. That expression, shame and contempt, everlasting shame, it doesn't say everlasting torture, but everlasting shame and contempt. But you see, you can be subject to shame and contempt whether you're alive or dead, whether you're conscious or unconscious, you're still subject to shame. Um, I don't believe, for instance, that Adolf Hitler is alive, but he certainly has my contempt, and I think he'll have the contempt for most of the human race for all eternity now for what he did. Uh, as other uh, war criminals, have that contempt for, for always. They will suffer everlasting contempt. But in the book of Revelation, which is highly symbolic, it's the most symbolic book of the whole Bible, the word torment is used in, a se in the same sense. And I don't have time to prove that now, but I can certainly, I would be happy to prove it to anybody that the word torment as used in the book of Revelation does indeed refer to that. So that would be my, my answer to that. But I, I personally do not believe that a loving God has any purpose to keep people alive only for the purpose of making them suffer. The concept I have of God, 
And the concept which I receive from the Bible is that God is not a psychopath. He is a loving creator. And what he does is for the benefit of mankind. And he says he does not desire the wicked to die. To die. Death is, over and over again, death is the penalty of sin, not torture. Okay. Then why church priest says to people they can, they can forgive people by confession? Do you think they are the God? In the first place, um, nobody can, can forgive the sins of another. Um, I can forgive sins that are committed against me personally. So if somebody steals something from me, and they come and confess it, and they, and they apologize, and they make restitution, I can forgive them and will do so. But I can't forgive somebody who's murdered somebody else, uh, not of my family, because how can I forgive them that, that crime? Uh, I, it's, it's, it's a, maybe the person, the relatives can forgive the murderer, but they can't forgive anyone. Nobody can forgive anybody on, on, on the part of God. We don't have that, that, um, uh, that right, that power to forgive somebody on the, uh, speaking for God. But I do believe that we should, we do, and we should forgive one another our sins committed against one another. That's something quite different. But this has nothing to do with confession as it's usually practiced and going to a priest and confessing sins and the sin the priest is supposed to be acting for God that I do not see at all in the Bible for your uh, for visiting and sharing this night with us and thank you for your stamina just coming right away from the airport on behalf of the Islamic Information and Da'wah Center please I invite you again to visit tomorrow at 5.30 the rest of this uh, topic or another topic is the accuracy of the gospel. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Good night.